Hello? Sorry about that. Our guest is finding it difficult to come on to the show. He's never been on one before. Uh, so he just called me on my personal phone, and uh, I've just explained, giving him final instructions. So he should be coming in uh, right now, actually. I just saw him here, I think. Oh, we're ducky there? Can you hear me now? Okay, we just. Hello, Jackie. Hello, hello, Jackie. Jackie. Hello, Jackie. Yeah, how are you? Can you you hear me now? Yeah, I'm getting you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, yeah, sometimes it's a bit difficult to come in. Thank you. I must tell you though, I mean I must tell you a lot of people have logged in. I think you you bring a lot of people with you, so that's a good thing. Um, uh, I don't know if you were on when we played the Liberal National Anthem and uh I was talking about you before your line went off and so uh we would just would not want to repeat that, you know, that a lot of people here waiting to listen so to listen to you. So what we do from this point on, uh yeah, hang on, better yet. Uh, I'm going to start this over for recording purposes. Stay there. Don't go anywhere, brother. I just stay there. Stay where you are, please. Okay. Hold on. Who's calling me, so? Yeah, uh, but Jackie, can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing you. Okay, only thank you, sir. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, that's all you're gonna hear. I mean, uh, when, I, when I'm my voice, you're gonna hear. When I'm the uh, voices of other people you hear too when they, they do decide to ask questions. So, good evening and welcome to uh, another, to yet another edition of uh, the Liberian Diaspora Forum Show. We call these special editions because they fall outside of our normal Sunday weekend programming, and we use these shows uh, weekday. Uh, shows mainly to accommodate the business schedule of our visiting guests and other important community leaders, like the one we have tonight, Honorable Mamadi Dakide of Renaissance Communication in Liberia. Honorable Dakide came recently as part of President Ellen Johnson's Salif delegation to the United Nations, and he's expected to return to Liberia sometime next week. Tonight, he's going to be speaking to us, or with us rather, about the looming challenges. Uh, of, of social and political integration of the Madinga community into post-war Liberia democracy. Uh, as usual, Honorable uh, Dagida will be giving uh, anywhere between 10, 5 to 10 minutes uh, to make a short presentation about that subject. Uh, and then shortly after that, I will open up your lines and so you can begin asking your questions. So Honorable Dagida, welcome to the Liberian Diaspora Forum. The, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, Mr. Kromar, thank you very much. I'm so happy, so glad to be uh, on uh, your network. I hope and pray that this will go beyond this one, that one they will see on a mainstream uh, radio station uh, relaying and broadcasting programs from uh, the diaspora. I'm so happy to be on your program tonight. Well, as a point of introduction, I think it's appropriate that I you know, give a little bit of information about myself, at least to place you know, the listener in proper perspective as to the person talking to all of you tonight. Again, my name is uh, Fanta Mamadi Suleimani Jakite, and uh, from that you will know that uh, my mother's name is Fanta, and uh, my father is Suleiman. I was born and brought up in the uh, small coastal city of Greenville, Sino County, uh, to uh, the union of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Diakite. I started my formative academic pursuit at the James Green English and Arabic School, and later on and, uh, I went to the St. Joseph Kelly School. Subsequently, when the sounds of Vicky 47 started in Liberia, uh, we crossed over to Guinea, uh, where I enrolled at the Zig Refugee School and graduated in 1996. Uh, back in Liberia, I continued my studies and then attended the African Methodist Episcopal University where I read political science 
as major and uh, English literature as a minor. Uh, currently, I am a, a graduate in senior from the Louis Adergram School of Law. And then uh, if everything goes on well, this summer I should be working with an LLD. I have uh, several pieces of <laughs> certificate, like I like to call them. They are on the wall everywhere and speak to my uh, professional standing as a media practitioner. So that constitutes a little bit about myself. Today I have been asked by the Diaspora and uh, Radio Forum to talk about uh, something very important that has to do with uh, political integration from Madingo's challenges and effects of uh, the Liberian civil crisis. And uh, for the sake of this interaction, I think I will concentrate on the aspect that uh, has to do with uh, social integration, and uh, which is more easier and uh, can be and, uh, understood by many persons than discussing and, uh, political integration, uh, which has to do, first of all, <laughs> that is not what I think that we should be talking about now. We should be talking about the social integration, which is very important, and the challenges facing Liberian Madingos. I will try to deal with it uh, from the perspective of uh, specifically the Madingo community, and the historical link, and how we see the future. However, uh, before talking about this uh, social integration of Liberian Madingos into the Liberian society, it is better that I place you in, uh, in the law of what constitutes integration or social integration in the first place. You know, Mr. Kroma, we have several types of integration. <laughs> you have heard about uh, racial integration, economic integration, academic integration, some people even speak of regional integration that we have with ECOWAS. And those of all who have had the opportunity to study a little bit of law, we have something they call integration clause, and that has to do with the final statement of the parties to the contract. But in this case, or from uh, the sociology or the social science perspective, and the social integration refers to concerted efforts uh, by mostly minority or underprivileged uh, social groups into finding space in the mainstream of any society. And uh, social integration speaks a volume when you look at the political history and uh, of the group that is trying to uh, integrate. And with it, uh, it will be important to ask a few questions. Are uh, Liberian Madingos <laughs> socially integrated into the Liberian society? What are the causes or the failure for the integration, quote unquote, of Liberian Madingos into the mainstream society? What can be done by we or by Madingos in general uh, to be integrated into the quote unquote mainstream Liberian society? And how can we as a people and the tribe specifically attain that? You know, a few days ago, I was in a chat with uh, a few of my colleagues from uh, the media uh, from La Côte d'Ivoire, and this guy was asking questions about... Uh, I was asking him to tell me a little bit about himself. He's, his name is uh, Ahmed uh, Sheikh Bagayuko, and then uh, he told me a little bit about himself, saying that uh, his father is from La Côte d'Ivoire, and he was a planter of cocoa. He worked on the cocoa plantation. Uh, at the time, the Madingos in La Côte d'Ivoire faced the same situation some time ago that we were facing as the Liberian Madingos. And he said they were involved in training the young people in making sure that they have the best of education to the extent that their fathers, their parents at the time who were working on plantation were go to the other tribes in the Côte d'Ivoire that were in government or in the mainstream of the Ivoire society and pay for scholarship for their children to travel to France to learn. They were not encouraging them to continue on the same path like the fathers were doing that is working on the cocoa plantation or involved in uh, you know, petty trade and the rest of them. They were doing that because they were looking beyond you know, and I fell in love with his story, and I asked myself, was that something that we practice in Liberia? 
Was that something that our fathers thought about that they could do so that we could be, you know, socially integrated into the Liberian society? I think that was not possible, or they were not thinking that way because most of them thought that uh, they would go back to some other place that they came from, whether it's in Burkina Faso, it's in Guinea, or it's in La Côte d'Ivoire, or it's in Sierra Leone. Social integration for Madingos in the sub-region have never been a problem, except in Liberia, where we still find it difficult, or other Liberians still find it difficult to accept Liberian Madingos as a part of the mainstream Liberian society just because of their tribe. And uh, my own personal analysis of this thing, we as Madingos have some role to play in this quote-unquote neglect or failure to be integrated into the Liberian society. When I was a boy coming up, uh, my interaction with non-Madingos was not so extensive because and uh, my parents had the belief that uh, if at all I had a direct link and I believe whether it was genuine, it was based on fact or mere perception that is open to a debate and argument. To the extent one time I remember that my mother saw me walking with somebody going to our yard who was not a Malingo, and then she came running to me and saying, you can't be with these people, you know. They are not people that will give you good upbringing. You know, so we're always seeing ourselves as some people you know, who were not part of the main society but just came to spend some time and will return back to somewhere, whether it's in Guinea or in La Côte d'Ivoire. In fact, my father, when you told my father, Alama Sultan Nanfudila, he would all be happy and then say, Amina, because he expected to go somewhere. He came to Liberia on a venture on the search for wealth. And so one day he was thinking that he was go by. So the social context, the planning process, the integration process, which was necessary for us, for we that are here today, was not laid down by most of our parents. They were thinking, and when the war came, we went back to the quote-unquote soul. We didn't see so. <laughs> we were also treated as strangers. So the fact that we refuse, some of us, not every one of us, refuse to accept Liberia based on the historical fact that we have a link, genuine historical reality, genuine historical link that gives us all the rights that any, and like any other Liberian, we refuse to take hold of those reality and make effective use of them. Leaving to all Liberians seeing us as people who have come and one day they will go. Not everybody now, but some people. We have a long history. Remember, we have some Madingos who participated in, of course, the formative years of this country. You remember King Sao Boso? You remember Ibrahim Asise, who used to be a very strong warrior in the Bapolu and Cape Man area? He wrote in Arabic. He was part of this system a very long time ago. Though historians have refused to recognize his contribution to the state, Yes, the conduct of some of the people after him by seeing themselves as strangers in their own country, refusing for their children to at time interact with the mainstream Liberian society, continue to unfold today, and it has resulted in the social integration problem in Liberia. Now, what do we do as a young generation or as people who are trying to find a space? in current and contemporary Liberia. We have to do several things. And including, we have to extend our involvement in social activities, political activities, get involved in mainstream community activities in our country. This is important. I remember very well somewhere in Mama Point was sitting down and there was a community announcement going on by Norma Dingos. Come Sunday, we have a meeting. There is a garbage somewhere. We want to see whether we can collect the garbage. We want to form a community grouping to you know, work towards it. And we're sitting with a few of our Madingo brothers you know, who shown that argument. And then they used words that to me was very sarcastic. That, oh, those are the people thing. And I said, no, you live in the community. All our community members are organizing groupings. They are organizing institutions to see how they can tackle the problems facing the community. You cannot see yourself as a stranger in your own land. Attend the meeting, make a contribution, feel part of the society, engage them, ask for leadership rule, contribute. 
then you will be seen as somebody that is prepared to accept the quote-unquote integration that we saw, that we are now speaking about and in need of. This is very important. We have to move in the community, join the social groupings. We have to interact with the people in the community, see them as Liberians, as we expect them to see us as Liberians. Let's forget about how they would think about us or how they would behave, but we have to contribute to this process of fully being integrated into Liberian society, regardless of how they see us, we have to do our part. Number two, we have to also realize that it is important that we detach or break that link, that quote-unquote perception that we have to go somewhere else in Latin Liberia. Everything we have, everything we need, and everything we do, we should place at the back of our mind that the nationality that we hold is Liberia and our commitment to Liberia must be very strong. This would be very important for the other aspect of this integration that we are discussing, the called the political aspect. Because in politics, in order for people to give you political power, they must first of all realize that you are somebody who is part of them. Realizing from the way you behave, your conduct, your philosophy, this is not in any way saying that I'm asking to relinquish the Madingo culture. No, 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 that's not it. But we should see and present ourselves, first of all, as Liberians in the way we talk and in the things we do. And Mr. Kruma, this is a very important topic, and everything I say here is, is and, uh, and will constitute my personal seeing and experience that I've acquired over the very short time. You know that uh, you know I have an eye for the past, you know, several years that I've been in active Liberian uh, political social life. I realize that the problem sometimes starts with we the Liberian Madingos, how we see the Liberian identity and how we must apply it. I think with that, I want this to be interactive. Uh, we'll just stop here and then expect uh, to see and uh, what will be some of the questions and how we can, you know, cross-fertilize our ideas for the betterment of this quote-unquote and the social integration. Thank you, Mr. Jackie. There, no, no, no wonder. Now I know why you are the hottest talk show host of our time in Liberia. There's no doubt, no question about it. That was an excellent de deliberation. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you're just joining us uh, tonight, we have the honor of uh, 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 being in company with uh, Honorable Modi Jackie, there, uh, the hottest talk show host of uh, Renaissance Communications in Liberia. Uh, he's visiting the U.S. He came as part of. Uh, President Helen Johnson salutes delegation to the United Nations. Uh, I'm told he should be returning sh shortly sometime next week or the week after. Tonight, he stopped by to talk to us about the looming challenges of uh, social and political integration of the Mazingo community into the mainstream Liberian politics. So if you just join us, welcome and thank you. So we will now move on to uh, the question and answer uh, about comment. If you have any comment, or question, or concern, by all means, please dial star 61. Uh, Brother Jackita is here with us, and he's here uh, to talk to us uh, pretty much. So, Brother Jackita, while we are with our callers mm -hmm. to start making their entry, so if you have any questions, star 61, uh, as usual, dial star 61, and uh, we'll get your question over to Brother Jackita. So, the question I'd like to start with Brother Jackita is that uh, oftentimes we've heard that the Civil War, that, you know, the just ended Civil War was a game changer. Uh, I've often, I've, I've, uh, uh, I can't count how many times I've been told that uh, that things are now different, a lot more different than they were before the Civil War. Now, the question that often comes to mind, how are things different? Are, they, are things different for the better or things different for the worse vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the subject on the discussion? Uh, it, it's, it's two ways. Uh, first of all, let me just say this. The, the Liberian Civil War, if I can identify uh, who among all the tribes in Liberia that uh, suffered extensively as a direct exponential effect of the war, and uh, I will be biased and say that the Madingos do. We lose a whole lot in the war. Before the Liberian Civil Crisis, you will realize that uh, we occupy a very significant portion of our economy. The transportation sector was dominated by Madingos. The produce buying and selling sector was dominated by Mandingos. The petroleum and uh, uh, the petroleum sector was dominated by Mandingos. We have all these key economic and a, and a, and a business economic situation on our side. 
before the civil crisis. Our economic standing as a community was great. We had Madingo's organizations, Madingo businesses that were doing very well. The war came, and today we've lost those significant states in our business sector because of the, the, the because of the civil crisis. So the war reflected ugly, very ugly on Liberian Madingo's. Now it has another good side. And, uh, the civil crisis, after the civil crisis, you're seeing Madingos now, and uh, let's say coming out of their shells, you know, moving forward, trying to see and do what I just mentioned, getting involved in the mainstream Liberian social political life. And, but before I continue on the good side, I'd like to stress also some of the ugly parts of the civil crisis. The civil crisis introduced armed violence in Liberia that comes with the side effect of drugs and alcohol. Now in Liberia, you go and, uh, in the ghetto. Before the civil crisis, you would not imagine seeing a Seku or a Mamadi there. We have some of our brothers, the remnants of the civil crisis that were fighting the war out of a good reason of a bad one that had time to take up guns. They did not use the war year to acquire training. They were fighting the war. Now the war is over. The rehabilitation and, uh, has not been so good for them. Now they have ended up uh, on the street, ended up drugging, taking drugs, and then uh, being car loaders down the street. This is sad to me. And this is one of the sad effects of the civil crisis or the Liberian civil crisis on the Madingo community. At times when you hear somebody, <laughs> you know, the rogue been arrested or been beaten, and you say, oh, you're leaving me for God's sake, Madingo. You know, this is something unusual. But of course, those are the sad effects of war. War is not good. It has never been good, although history is replete of instances where people are taking on arms, you know, for so many reasons. But in the Liberian case, the Madingo community was badly hit by the war. Now, this is another side of the war that some people point out, although I don't like to emphasize it, because if at all I was not involved extensively in uh, the better side of Liberian the society before the civil crisis, given the fact that I was not so exposed, but I've read and I've talked to people who were good for us. At the moment, there are, few, there are several Madingos because of the war who are brave who see the war years as an opportunity that I expose them to and uh, quote-unquote fighting for their rights and getting involved in advocacy and uh, being strong on the political scene. You see young Liberians, Madingos, leaving college now are no longer concerned about their names or their trap, but they are venturing into areas. This is one good thing about the war. Like I am now, I am a, a talk show host, and I don't know how to call myself one of the hottest or best talk show hosts, but in my own weak way. And when I come on radio and I say my name is Mamadi, 10, 15 years ago, that was not something so easy. You know, because uh, perhaps we're not timid, or we were not quote unquote educated to that extent, but we had all brave to come on radio or say or participate or do something because of the perception that we have within ourselves about ourselves at the time. And that was a constraint, you know, for people to feel, realize, or accept our relevance. So the war had a little bit of good side, but on the whole, the Liberian civil crisis really, in my own analysis, and I hold it as my personal view, was very bad for us. Another good side that some people also I want to attach to where it gave opportunity to most of our community members and you know, to see themselves in the diaspora as a direct exponential effect of the civil crisis. They got you know, you know, a good status to live in America. They've, they got the kids, they're bringing them up in the very good uh, society, giving them education. Also, that has a sad side. It has another side too. You know, depending on who see American passport or being in America, you know, some of uh, our Liberian brothers here, and this is not one of my dingoes, you know, like I like to tell people, American passport, American citizenship is an economic asset that if appropriately used or widely used, will not only benefit the person, but will be extended to his community. Diaspora residents have always been significant and very important to those of us in Africa, if at all, is effectively used. And I will come to that, I uh, will come to the root of the Liberian diaspora, my language, and what they can do. So only over uh, the civil crisis for me, and uh, it's about 60% odd for the Liberian Madingo community. But that is history, it's beyond us. Uh, the bad ones that are there, the bad ones that are there, we can work on it, and they can become good, 
if we have to bring our ideas together, if we have to organize programs and projects, and we see those of our community members in Liberia and that are on drugs and uh, that are not doing well as a direct uh, effect of the civil crisis, I think that would be very good. But on the overall, the war was a very, 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 very damaging to our community. We lost our economic standing. The opportunity to go to school, we lost call. everything. Yeah. Okay. I'll take the first caller here. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, if you just joining us, we have the hardest talk show host here. So, if you if you don't ask your question tonight, I don't know when you're gonna ask it. But anyway, uh, star six one is what you need to dial and uh, what you need to dial to speak directly with uh, Honorable Mamadi Diakite. So, with that said, I'll take the first caller here, Honorable Sekou Kenneth, where are you calling from, and your question, sir. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Sekou Kenneth. You are very low, Seku. You are, I can barely hear you. Can you adjust your phone a little bit? You hear me now? Yeah, much better. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to uh, Bro Jackie Dave for taking the time to be on the show tonight. And actually, with the brilliant uh, presentation, I'm impressed. Um, I want to say thank you for stopping by. Um, some of the things that you search in your deliberation, uh, specifically the issue of integration, I personally think uh, the Madingo, the Abraham Madingo, we are integrated in the, in the Labrador society. But um, the only problem that we continue to face is acceptance from the other side. People who other people who have different perception about us. And my question to you is: Are we the Madingo, the one responsible for the negative perception the other non Madingo in Nigeria have for us, or is it just something, um, you know, it just hit us just simply because we are Madingo? What is your perspective on that? Thank you, Brian Kenny. Okay, but Barack Obama, uh, he, he he made a very vital point, and that's a very good question. Who is responsible for the state of Liberia Madingos with the question of uh, integration? Like I said from the beginning, is uh, is in the three folds. It has to do with uh, the history, how it's been told, because if you read Liberian history, the Madingos and the contribution, the Madingos coming has not been widely told. And that present the Madingo community and uh, to most Liberian as a as a new thing, you know. So they sort of see Liberian Madingos as strangers, and people who just came will go. That so historical, re- historical the history telling telling the story of Madingos have not been effective by Liberian and, uh, historian. Two, and uh, the uh, the Liberian society from the perspective of acceptance has been a problem. They have been not uh, to most Liberians have been very unfair and uh, to Liberian Madingos. And uh, from my perspective, my own understanding and experience, on one hand, we are responsible. On the way, sometimes we go about you know, how we see ourselves in our own country, how we refuse to be objective, how we refuse you know, to find our space in the mainstream Liberian society by our conduct. Like I just told you the story of our community meeting. I personally have a personal experience. I never used to, when I was coming here in Greenville, have very close friendship with Norma Dingos because my parents felt that uh, strange ideas, beliefs, and philosophy would be infiltrated into my person. And that would corrupt my way. They would corrupt my Islam. They would corrupt my Madingo culture. So caution was so high to the extent that other Liberians see us, the Madingo, as being strangers from the way we behave to them. It's not over. I know some Madingo family that have been so open and very protective of the Madingo culture or very protective of the fact that they have to inculcate the Madingo values in their children. They've been very careful on that. That was very good. But sometimes, you know, the way we operate in the community, I want to use the word Liberian parlance, you know, we present to the other Liberians that we are strangers who just come and want to go. And I told you, my father, he wanted to make the world for my father. He always prayed that he might get enough money to go back to where he came from. I was born and brought up in Liberia. This is the only country I know, you know, and this is the only country that I can call home. 
We went Guinea during the war. We never saw home. Yeah, you know, we never saw home. So it has been, it has been very, it has been, on, it has been a two-way street. You know, so I think. Uh, Oh, you on the phone? Oh, okay. No, so I think uh, history is responsible in the way we, we behave at some time. Okay, so, so before I think I that answer his question. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it does. Uh, before I take, whoa, I got questions about lining up like crazy then. But before I take the next question, though, uh, before, when you started answering his question, on our decade, you said that we, uh, Madingos, are responsible for the, uh, our non-acceptance. Do you mean, do you sincerely believe that we are partly responsible or wholly responsible? Isn't it? No, I just uh, said partly. Half? I just okay, said partly. Okay. I just said partly. Okay. Right, said partly right, because right, history right. is important, you know, right. and uh, so many things. For example, we took the Nimba question. The way it happened right. in Nimba, it didn't happen in a dying Lofa. The way it happened in Sano, it's not a dying Grandi there, you know. So different scenarios will give different realities. But on the overhaul, you know, there have been some unfairness to how they, you know, see us. Okay, thank you. I'll take the next question here. Uh, but I'm listening to Saka. Where are you calling from in your question? <laughs> Lusini Saka. Uh, thank you, Kofumba. Uh, my name is Lucini Saka, and I'm calling from Minnesota. Uh, Brother Jack D, thank you for coming on the show. Um, thank you. In as much as uh, some of us are trying to, um, uh, or some Madingo are trying to be active in Liberia to be involved with the process, um, in, in some cases, uh, most of the time, we are still being labeled as uh, non Madingo. We are still being called foreigners in, in some quarters. Um, the recent beating of uh, Imam Ansu in uh, Camp Play is a case in point. Um, being that you have um, a lot of experience, you know, um, since you've been in Liberia for a long time, in, in your view, how can we handle or how can we deal with the issues of being labeled non Madingo? How can we handle that issue? Thank you. Uh, okay, but, but, Saka, before, but Saka, before you go, did you say being labeled non Madingo or what do you mean? No, uh, non Liberians. Non Liberians, got you. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> all right. Yeah. Uh, I understand. Okay, uh, uh, only for example, the, uh, the question you asked about uh, the uh, Imam in, uh, what do you call it, Kambli. I followed that story extensively. It was even on our radio. We had two Saturdays, but I don't like to say the other side. But let me just categorically state that he was seen, he was believed, he was misjudged as being a non Madingo, as being a non Liberian. And in the process of him trying to prove his Liberian, his Liberianness or his Liberian identity, he had a scuffle with an immigration officer. He was brutalized, and that was very sad. Personally, talk to people at the immigration, and these are things that happen. And this is not fair. But what do we do to erase these type of things? Like I just said from the beginning, we need to do it in an organized way. In Liberia, we have a very robust, educated, smart, emerging, young Liberian Madingos that are in advocacy and this type of thing, when it comes up, they talk about it, they bring it to the public glare, they discuss it. And I can tell you for sure, every day it's reducing, given the fact that they know how strong we are becoming. And the way we're doing it, we are not doing it in a violent or non-democratic or illegal fashion. When things like that happen, we bring it to the media. At times we go to court, at times we confront the administration. We confront the appropriate authority. We are proving ourselves to be civilized, to be intelligent, to be very, very strong in our advocacy and the channels we talk in addressing issues. And this is one of the ways we can do it. When something happens, we take the appropriate stand. Because sometimes many persons see the Madingos as being violent people. And this whole violent thing about the brand Madingo comes as a direct effect of the civil crisis. But at the moment, we're taking a very peaceful channel in addressing most of our issues. And sometimes you hear from even normal dingoes saying, this is not fair. We should stop this thing. For the first time in recent Liberian history, because most Madingos in Liberia practice Islam, it doesn't mean that the, the Islamic religion is equivalent to the Madingo and a, and a tribe. 
they are two distinct things. But in Liberia, the line is so thin that whenever you are a Madingo, you are assumed to be a Muslim. For the first time in Liberia, they just ended Ramadan was very, very different. Prominent government officials came on our network and sent Ramadan message to Liberian Muslims. Senator Taylor, Edwin Snow, Defense Minister, Education Minister, more than 20. And they paid for it. We went to them, we recorded them. And on the morning show, they called and then said, my Muslim brother, tell them, salam alaikum. And to me, this only presents one fact, that Liberia is getting better, that the trend is changing, that people are now gradually accepting the fact that Madingos, Liberian Madingos, are indeed part of the society and they should so be recognized. We have to continue the part of nonviolence. We have to be active with uh, our activities when it comes to legal approach. We have to present ourselves as better people. We should not yield to provocation. It happens all around the world. I traveled just outside Monrovia the last time. I had two Madingos ladies with me in the car were giving lift. And the level of questioning some of, one of the ladies was, was, was suggested to was so outrageous. But every stop we had, we had two stops. Each of the two stops, I took time to explain to the guys that were subjecting the woman to unnecessary questioning to understand that this country cannot go anywhere except we realize the historical fact that Madingos are part of the society, except we forget about what happened during the war. Everybody got killed. I lost people, you lost people, everybody, the Guillermo, everybody got somebody affected during the war. So what happened during the war? Let's leave it with the writers of history to determine who was wrong. Let's pull it behind us. Whether they kill your party, kill your man, that was being traumatic, but be strong. Let's move forward as a country. See Liberia as our country and then work towards sustaining this process of social integration. Violence will not solve the problem and we are moving away on the right trajectory. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you're just joining us, uh, we have uh, Honorable Mamadi Dakite, uh, the hottest talk show host in Morovia. Uh, we, we are lucky to have him tonight. Uh, Mr. So Goma, before, before, you ask, before you ask a question, you yeah. know, this thing about Madingo culture, every one of us has a responsibility to put it along. We have that duty to our conscience and to the fact that our culture, we deserve it and we respect it. When I'm on the radio, my name is by just saying this is Mama Di Diagite. Good morning and welcome to the breakfast show. It means a whole lot. And every opportunity I have, I play my dingo music. But I don't do it in a way to show that I am putting a madingo agenda. But I smartly intersplice my ding my madingo ness or my madingo love through my presentation. I present myself in a way that they will see the other side of my dingo man. And when issues on the radio that has to, when issues on the radio that have to do with Madingo, I'm very, very careful on how I speak because I'm striving and trying to win the admiration and to convince other people that regardless of your negative perception about the Madingo man, he still stands a better country, he still stands a better chance to contribute to the overall good of the society. So when you have an opportunity as a Madingo man, it's so discouraging to hear corruption stories behind a Madingo man. If it heightens, it hurts me, and then it's a demotion and grace, then it's a demotion for the community and the process of other Madingos. This is why I told most of our Madingo brothers, when you have position of trust, prove yourself good. Prove that at this level you are a janitor, you're doing your janitorial work very well, then you can be entrusted with the supervisor work. Then when the political season comes, now many persons in Liberia believe that the Madingo people are serious people. Somebody was on my, my radio the last time, Emmanuel Buyo. He said through our history, through our Liberian history, most of the general in the uh, Liberian army at the time was called the Frontier Force, they were Madingos because their loyalty was fixed as the Northern Star. They were committed to their job. And they demonstrated patriotism and love for the country. So if you go on Camp Johnson Road, there is a Jalaba Yade. He used to be a general in the, in the, in the uh, defense, of a liberal defense force. You know, so we have to set good example as Madingos. Do it smartly, not arrogantly. Do it with the understanding that this Liberia belongs to all of us. And let us stop using words that the other people don't like us. If they don't, just leave that. Just imagine that it doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. 
and build yourself with something positive. You know, positive thinking and positive attitude when you really behave positive. It's a it's, it's a therapy in yourself. You know, Brother Kuma? So, you know, we gotta we gotta change the way we see this whole quote unquote they don't like us. Yeah, that's true. Few people don't like us, some people don't like us. No matter because some people have their personal reasons against Madingo that is in our our relationship with some of them in the past, the issue of marriage, intermarriage, those issues have been there and that it has been there, it has been there and we're trying not to see how we can uh, you know, modify, refine our interaction with other Liberians with the objective of being okay. integrated in the ministry. We'll take the next question here. Uh, thank you. If you just don't even start 61, it's, it's what you need to die to uh, ask your questions. Uh, my next call is uh, Emmanuel Togba. Emmanuel Togba, your line is open. Uh, where are you calling from? And your question, Emmanuel Togba. Hello, Emmanuel? Am I not over? All right, I'll take my next call out here. Uh, 1881, uh, your name, where are you calling from, and your question. 1881. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, it's me again, Tipu Kenner. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you for thank you for giving me the opportunity again. Um, I just have uh, one, one more question for, for the guests. Like, um, so executive, as you said, we Madingo, we got to watch for each other and make sure we be a good ambassador for the larger Labrador Madingo community. Well, do you think that we have, uh, that Madingo, we have a lot of Madingo in Liberia from different to, to geographical um, regions? Do you think we have some Madingo, I mean, some Liberian Madingo are more Liberian than the other? Based on the geographical study. Thanks. All right, thank you, Mr. Kenny. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Dagit, are you there? Yeah, okay, uh, Mr. Yeah, Kuma. Just, yeah. so, just, just so you know, just so you know, I got a lot of questions lined up here, and I actually took that question in error. You know, it was it came before the question that I intended. But yeah, so if you want to keep your answers, you know, a little bit moderate, so we can accommodate everyone, that'll be great. So. Thank I, you. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, he asked whether there are more Liberians. Are there, are there Liberian Madingos that are more Liberians than other Madingos? Are there La Ma Madingos <laughs> that are considered more Liberians than some other Madingos? I, I that can say that for I can say that for true. There are some Liberian Madingos within themselves that see more Liberian Madingos than others. And then uh, when you are very smart, you know who I'm referring to. But I don't like this division talk. I don't like this thing about more Liberian and less Liberian. For example, me, I'm from the Madingo, she called Madinka, or uh, Madingo, the hard one. I'm part of it. And it's time you were here among ourselves, we calling one another names. This would not help. My understanding of Liberian identity is constitutional. There is nothing they call more Liberian and less Liberian. They have Liberian. Whether you see yourself thousand years in history, and I see myself thirty years, we are all qualified before the law, and the designation given to a national of Liberia attaches to every one of us without distinction. So that thing is just a perception that some people have. That, for example, if I'm from Lopa County, I am more Liberian Madingo than somebody who comes from Montserrado County. It won't help. So my my only advice on this point is that. Let us try and reduce this thing. It's just not fair. If you are a Liberian, Madingo, you are a Liberian, Madingo, as described and qualified on our laws. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll take the next question here. Um, Salif Swilo. Swilo Salif. Uh, where are you calling from in your question? Yes, good evening. This is Mabiam, Mabiam Donzo Salif. Welcome to the Liberian Diaspora Forum. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Honorable Diakite, welcome. What a nice discussion. Thank you. Good. Um, this the subject matter is extremely important because it ties into the historical background of Liberia, and therefore I'm gonna track back to history. Right. Uh, 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 Mabonye, but before before you begin, may I remind you that uh, you don't have a whole lot of time. Okay. Give, I'm like, going to be very like brief. Like a minute and a half. Right. Okay. 
Okay. My question is, well, my concern with respect to the, the Mandingo social and political integration lies absolutely within the historical background of Liberia, meaning that the fear which conquered our fathers or our parents for not allowing the Madingo children to join the quote unquote other people is historical. Because back then, before one, every tribe in Liberia, before one could actually be accepted by, because you know, during the 1800s, everything about Liberia uh, operation was handed over to the American Liberian quote unquote conquerors, right? So, and there are rules and regulations where before you get integrated or before you join us, you must, you must change your name, you must deny your culture, you must deny a lot of stuff. And that was an absolute threat to the Madingo culture or to every culture as a whole. But a lot of other cultures were willing to forgo some of those stuff, and the Madingo absolutely refused for that. And you can see elements of some of our Madingo grandfathers who did that, right? So that fear, that fear was very significant because for anybody to integrate in any society, relinquishing who you are by culture is not relevant, it's not required. And okay, they, the they from the Madingo yeah. refuse to relinquish their culture, right? They were then turned into the political chip of being foreigners. How come so what is we were able okay, so. to? No, no, I'm, I'm just. How come we yeah, were well, able yeah, to conquer all the you're other? Out, you're co- out of time, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You're out of time. Just, just sum okay. up, yeah. Yeah, uh, please, please answer my question. Yeah, just, just sum up. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, you done there? Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I, I just tried to sum it up, uh, and I think okay. Mr. Diakite has an idea of what I'm talking about. Because, take okay, for please. example, in America here. Doing the uh, um, do, doing the struggle for reintegrate uh, for integration of social, political, and economic integration for minority in America, no one no one had to relinquish who they were. In- okay, we have to leave it there, Mr. Uh, Mr. Salif. So, Honorable uh, uh, Jackie, there you you got you got the idea. Yes, so you, uh, let you me can, about you care to comment uh, on that? Yeah. Yeah, let me express my delight that in Mambia when she was in Monrovia, mm-hmm. she came on my show. And she raised a very valid point. Uh, you know, the uh, the two weak party uh, for over a hundred years uh, dominated everything in Liberia, politics specifically, and they practice a kind of uh, exclusionism theory, uh, subjecting most of uh, the non-American Liberians to abject poverty and exclusion from mainstream urban political life, to the extent that uh, before one becomes And this is restricted, first of all, to governance, uh, the political governance structure. Before one enters that structure, you must have some direct link with either the Masonic craft, the True Week Party, or the person must have a history of American Liberian. This is a fact. And I want to also speak to, regardless of the fact that that existed, we have Madingos at the time that were trusted, not because they were Madingo, but because but because they were out of part of the Masonic Christ society or they were Christians, and because of that relationship, they were part of the system. Yes, I agree that our parents had some genuine concern and fear being protected of the Madingo culture, refusing the infiltration of foreign, foreign behavior into their case. That was true, and that was part of the genuine concern they had. But how did they do it? Did they do it to the totality? Or were they doing it out of mere fear without an, uh, scaling the better side of the integration process? Or without being... In, because, because, for example, I remember very well Momolu, uh, Momolu Dukle, I think Momolu Salivo Dukle, one time was asked to change his name. And then he refused. In the face of his refusal, they saw something competent. They saw competence in him. And they accepted him in the system. He was, in fact, I think the first foreign minister of Liberia uh, during the the, the, the Tobo regime. Not the first, but he was a foreign minister in the in the top the top man regime. And he worked based on his competence. He stood his ground. So he didn't have to really change. But he was part of the system, and he met 
retained the, that identity, and he practiced to some extent his Madingo culture. So, you know, it's a, it's a kind of mixed thing. But what I'm trying to really preach is that we have to agree and understand that we have a stick in the Liberian society. We have to get involved, but also be very sensitive of ideas, of practices and principles that will corrupt and hamper the Madingo culture and identity. That is very important. That's a caveat. Well, I agree, with my, I agree with, with Mambi, you know, they have some genuine fear. For example, if you went around somebody who was not a normal Dingo or a normal Muslim at the time, it's believed that you will become a Christian or you will turn, you will behave or do things that were are not consistent with the Islamic teaching and practices. So there's a fear they had. But they also had a duty at the time to allow the children to have slow integration into activities in the community, join clubs in the community, participate in political party activities, join social groupings. Those are not things that will force you to relinquish your cultural or religious practices. So okay. that, that's not right, we'll everybody the contribution yeah. are all good. All right, I'll take the next caller here. Uh, as a reminder, and you can uh, make your entry as many times as you like. Uh, just just be mindful that you have limited time to ask your questions. And so you can break it into parts, you know, give one portion first, and then uh, you can always make a second entry uh, as many times as you like. So my next uh, caller will be Ishmael Kobara. Brother Ishmael Kobara, uh, where are you calling from and your question, sir? Ishmael Kobara? Ishmael Kumara. Ishmael Kumara. All right, he must not be by his phone, so uh, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, Brother Mohamed Dale, uh, where are you calling from and your question, sir? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, get it welcome. This is Mohamed Dale from Minnesota. Uh, so happy to hear your voice. Uh, you keep saying that except we have to coexist with other people. But I, I agree with that fact. But how do we continue to accept our brothers or our own countrymen when yet then still the, the caution that uh, our Sato gave you, uh, beating an imam because he does not have an adika? How do we stop those perceptions in Liberia about Madingo people? How? And thank you. Thank you, brother Dale. Bro, 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 the question is, in the face of the rejection or the refusal from the other Liberians, what do we do? I don't think uh, you are expecting to say we should turn fire for fire or we should continue in a form and fashion that will not be consistent with everything I just said. Yes, indeed, there are some Liberians who have been very unfair on how they see us. But the only thing that we can continuously do in our best interest is to present ourselves as being better people. The situation you just mentioned about beating an imam or beating a deputy imam or beating a Madingo man on the question of his identity, that single instance should not in any way cause us to reciprocate in like manner. But because of the man was beating, so today we will behave in a way that will still let other people know that we're not prepared for this integration. My point and my appeal to every Madingo listening to me here, we have to prove that we are better than them. We have to prove that we are more civilized, that we are not prepared any longer to take this country back the path that they are taking it to. One of the reasons of Liberian civil crisis is exclusion that because you don't want me to be part of this system. This is why the American Liberians organized and then funded Mr. Taylor because they wanted a space. They won't push us down that road, inshallah. We will not in any way go back and take up arms because we know in the first place, depending on who speaks, the war has its good and its bad side. But for me, I think we, the bad side for us was higher than the good one. And I play at 64, however, that is debatable and we can leave that. But our response based on isolated instances, based on situations that we will keep on referring to, like the beating of the imam, it will stop us from moving forward. That issue of beating the imam, it was very, very wrong. It was unfair. It was total display of, of, of lack of professionalism on the part of the immigration officer. No one on our law should be beaten, should be in prison, should be, not should happen to anybody because the person refused to present a Liberian passport or a Liberian identity to prove a citizenship. That's no ground 
to brutalize the person to the extent that later on it got to be known that he was a clergyman, he was a member of the Islamic faith, and he was a deputy imam. Make it very sad. Well, let pull it be or let it be, you know, a point of reference and uh, to make us strong, to realize that we have more to do and we have to work together. We need advocates in our community. We need lawyers. When these situations come, we take them to court. And that's all we can do. And I can tell you, Barbara, it's changing. The Liberia you knew 10 years ago when it comes to the hit from a bingo. Many normal Liberians have now accepted or are accepting the fact that we have to coexist. We only have to work on this. We have to increase the number based on how we treat them and how we operate in the Liberian society. We have to be, you know, I just want us to, to accept this as a fact that we need one another. This is our country. For some of us, we see our future in Liberia. We know that the day will come where somebody will say, my name is Seku, and we can see more Koli, more Kuluba, more other Liberians behind him and saying, we trust you because you have proven that in the face of adversity, in the face of provocation, in the face of display of hate, you are strong. You did not return hate for hate, but you gave love where there were hate, you brought peace where there were war, and you took peace where people were, were scrambling and fighting among themselves. So those are things that are exhibit. We can return fire for fire in this situation. We are minority, and the strength of every minority is the display of quality. The moment we continue to display those good attributes, my brother, 10, 15 years from now, I don't know, some people think it's impossible, but I think it's better because we had a situation with Mr. Benito running for the FA um, position, and there was this thing that nobody can vote for a Madingo man, and we have only two Madingos in the LFA executive committee. He won. We're making history. We have Madingo students in high school running for, 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 for senior class prefect. They've been voted for. And we are, we are trying to I mean, I mean, put these statistics together as a basis for us to understand that Liberia has been transformed. The ideology of hate of Madingo is being gradually evaded by a strong force of resilience from the Madingos. And we also have to continue. And you guys in the diaspora should be the place setter. You should be taking the lead in those community meetings as you go to. Tell the people that this is your right. It's inherent. and nobody can take it from you. We are Liberians. Nobody can take that. But well, how can we be in our country like going string you like strangers in your own land based on how you behave? So that's my point. Thank you. Let's just work on the good side. Thank you. Uh let me try but, uh, uh, this guy again see if he's back uh, back to his phone. Uh Ishmael Kumara, Mr. Ishmael Kumara. Yeah. Yes, I'm here, sir. Yeah, your question, sir. Uh, welcome to the Liberia <laughs> Diaspora Forum. Your question and where are you calling from? I'm calling from Brooklyn Park, gentlemen, and uh, Brother Jackie Day, Mohammed Jackie Day, I want to thank you very much. I'm first of all very proud of uh, the, uh, your, the, your eloquence. But uh, the question I have for you is that uh, my understanding uh, of the Liberian situation is that the, the kind of uh, aggressions, and in fact, uh, if you will, uh, against the Latino people, has not only been based on individuals, but it has also been an institutionalized uh, head, which you don't want us to call it that way. What is the government doing to, in terms of making deliberate effort to ensure that institutions uh, uh, take a role, a leading role, in making sure that the basic right that every Liberian should enjoy uh, 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 that Malingo people, in fact, uh, have that right like anyone else. Um, if you would address that question for me, we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Kumar. Mr. Kumar. Yeah, well, Brother Kumar, yeah, is, yeah. is, he, is he still on the line? Uh, Brother uh, Kumar? Yeah. yeah. Well, I can still find him. He hasn't left oh, yet. Okay, I... no, okay, uh, that was just an auto question. I can answer that question. He says some okay. of the rights Malingos have been denied. Yeah, and then, and then I, what I, is the government doing? What, no, what I'll measure? Come to the I will come to the institutional okay. thing. First of all, okay. no Madingo has been denied rights, quote-unquote, in Liberia. There will be isolated situations that can happen to other people sometime that Madingo people are suffering. But from the government perspective, endorsing violation of Madingo's right based on, quote-unquote, Madingo identity, I've never heard about that. Now, on the government side, 
when it comes to what the government is doing to protect rights of citizens, or in this case, of Madingos. I don't know of any instance of the violation of the right of a Madingo man that have been brought to public glare or to public light and uh, no action taken. The situation with the, uh, uh, the imam, we know what happened later on. The Liberian government, as we speak, is not perfect, like many other governments in history. It's not perfect. But like I can tell you, the deputy police director now, very sensitive position, is a Madingo man, a Bikrumah. And we know what went to the top of doubt some of us have. I personally told people that I don't see it so possible for Mr. Krumah to be entrusted with that job. But his credential as presented to the president was overwhelming. And the person who was in nearest competition to that job was nowhere. So what happened to his Madingo identity? It was buried because of his excellent standing. It would have been a violation. It would have been a stop in the bag of the government that professes qualification that stands for competence to have left Mr. Kumar out. He had been very, very detrimental. So that's the point. He came with something that everybody, he publishes a CV. And in contemporary Liberia, if you look for professional police officer based on credential and experience, with a little bit of experience from the army and a young man that has all the energy, you won't take anybody. Now, in the presence of that, you look at the situation that has to do with uh, an, an elections. In a dominated Madingo community, they will have Brother Kane and we'll have two other persons from central Monrovia that are in the place there, in the Liberian Parliament. What they will do will be important for other Madingos that are coming. On the governmental side or institutional side, I don't see a set policy or practice that speaks to quote unquote violations of fundamental rights of Madingo. To the extent that it has been brought to public there, look at a few days ago when we had a situation of the Islamic, uh, uh, the terrorism, something that happened in Libya when an American ambassador was killed. A newspaper carried a story that was to me blasphemous to Islam and the prophet of Islam. The Madingos in Liberia stood up. They didn't use guns, stones, or riot. They used the magic of the media. They brought their displeasure to the public glare, and the government was compelled to issue a statement condemning the newspaper and then warn the newspaper to be very sensitive of issues and, uh, that will give rise to chaos and violence in our country. And religion is a very sensitive thing. Tribe is a very sensitive thing. And in Liberia, Islam and Madingo are like synonymous. So you see, the way we approach things, sometimes we help. I don't imagine where we will have, for example, a lawmaker talking about somebody having an Islamic holiday or talking about rights of Madingo. Today it's happening in Liberia. We didn't imagine saying that this will happen. And let me tell you a story, Brother Kroma. In the early 50s, when we never had a mosque in Nima County, one of our brothers told me his father came to take ablution early in the morning behind one of Nima citizens' house. The man came also and saw him. He said, what are you doing here? He said, we're taking prey water. That citizen left and went to the commissioner of the time and said the Madingo man was doing medicine behind his house. The commissioner, very ignorant about Islam and know that ablution constitutes some of the fundamental rights of the man in the practice of a religion, asked this Muslim man to dig out the sand, pull it in the wheelbarrow, and carry a fire away or Satan, and then ask him to pay fine. But less than 10 years later, we have two smokes now standing in the heart of Ganda. What did that? Time. What did that? Resilience of Liberian Muslims and Madingo. So that's the point. You know, I know sometimes perhaps when I say some of these things, you will be doubtful. You say, okay, the hate is there. It will not change. All the things. But I'm trying to be positive. And I know being positive sometimes will help. I'm not dismissing the behavior of Everybody in Liberia has been, quote-unquote, anti-Madingo, to the extent that government will be anti-Madingo. Yes, there are, there are issues. <laughs> and uh, in terms of we are putting it, there are issues. We can okay. handle the ones more, small. Okay. Uh, before I take my next caller here, you know, when you're doing your deliberation, you alluded to 
uh, one of the uh, many sad and unfortunate uh, outcome of the Civil War, uh, uh, making specific reference to some of our brothers who are now alcoholic and uh, uh, substance abuse and all of that. So what is the Madingo community doing in Liberia, you know, to have that, to address that? You know, what programs, what sort of assistance, you know, are in place to make sure that those of our brothers, you know, do not remain like that? Okay, apart from individual um, Madingos in government, in business, personal contribution, silent contribution, oh man, can I say, give me $10, a person give it. There is no organized strategic approach to solving the problem of uh, destitution that our young members are facing. There is no organized program, like you would say, getting them off the street. While we started at the level of the National Madingo Caucus, which was not an open thing, but I have to say here, we encourage most of them, most of them to go to the police and the army. I remember I gave three persons money. Gentlemen, go get your phone. Get in the process of joining the army. Because we knew the future of the Liberian army. We know that there will be time that uh, tribal representation will become an issue and will be considered. The army has to be democratized from the perspective of tribal geographic uh, representation, which is very important. And when they go there, they come back and say the money is small. They are not prepared to make sacrifices. They are not prepared to take up the pain for today and then get the enjoyment of tomorrow. And most of them did not end the training. They went back to the street. We've talked to people personally behind the scenes. Talk to one person, to a guard, a person to come in. They gave them the way. Less than three months, they are back out. Those were attempts that some of us did. Because with the sense they have this background with arms and ammunition or with the army, to find a career in the, in the new Liberian army was being trained by the American government. But today, when you look at the statistics, most of them have left. They have left out of driving taxi or loading car. Or most of them gone back to the port or gone back to being car balls and trucks. And if you drive through Ghana V, you start to this tire shop. I personally have gone there several times. You will see Madingo kids, three, four, five years, they stay in the repair of tire, pumping tire, and doing the type of old jobs. Although some of them are staying in school, they are going to school. But I know some too that are stay, that do, I do stay for pleasure in giving their children the type of work. It's not healthy and good for our future. It's not healthy and good for and our process of social political integration and our quest for political authority in Liberia. We need excellence. We need to see Mandingo entering a you know, professional career. We need to encourage our females. We need to give them special role. We need to and divert from this traditional role of seeing them as housewives. We need to encourage them to be brave, to be, to, to be women of substance. We have to start that from the home. Our mentality, those that are good, we keep them. Those that are anti to our progress, we relinquish them. And some of them is how we treat the female. That we see them as a thing that must get into marriage and then bear children. We have to give them the opportunity to be educated and challenge their entrance into uh, the new emerging Liberia that are going to be competitive. Okay, thank you. Uh, if you just joining us, we have Brother Mamadi Diakite, uh, the hottest talk show host from Liberia, and uh, obviously he came here with President Henry Johnson Salif to attend the United Nations Summit. Uh, he's talking about the challenges of uh, social and political integration of uh, the Madingos into mainstream Liberia politics. So if you just joining us, you have question, comment, or concern by all means, please dial star 61. Uh, I must also remind you that uh, everything that's said here has been has been recorded, and so uh, this is our third special edition of the Liberian Diaspora Forum. Uh, the first one was Jemba Fanda, Musa Obama Dingo Association, and uh, the second one was uh, Nimba County District Number no. Seven Representative Honorable Dona. So we're having a third special edition tonight with Honorable Mamadi Jackita. So I'll take the next question here. Uh, Al Donzo, where are you calling from? And your question, sir. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome to the United States. Uh, this is Chris D. Aldonzo. Uh, first of all, I would like to commend you for your uh, excellent uh, uh, introductions uh, statements. Uh, having said that, I just have a statement that will be followed by a quick questions. 
Now you will stress an important issue that has to do with the uh, integration of uh, Liberian Mandingo into the larger Liberian community. Uh, one thing that you just mentioned uh, that I believe is true is with regard to uh, working with other Liberians in other activities, like you mentioned the police, uh, the immigration, uh, uh, the fire service, uh, and so on. So, uh, But the problem our people uh, uh, having in Liberia, like you just mentioned, is about money. Uh, but sometimes when you work in government, we all understand that not everywhere in government you expect to get a large amount of money in your pocket. But sometimes you work in certain position or certain activity in government uh, for the sake of protecting your interest and your people's interest tomorrow. Uh, that's true. Uh, that's something that our community needs to work on. Now, my question to you, uh, you being in the United States and you uh, being the uh, the hatch uh, talk show host in Liberia, what do you think the Liberian community and the Liberian Madinga community in the United States uh, can play uh, with regard to the integration of our brothers in Liberia into the larger Liberian community? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dozo. Uh, 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 Chris D., uh, thank you very much for your question. You asked for the role of uh, Madingos in the diaspora and uh, in the quote unquote uh, integration process. I think uh, Madingos here have a lot to do, not only in the line, line of integration, but you can do more in sustaining the developmental process of the larger Liberian society. You know, Africa or uh, Sub Saharan Africa. Most of our intellectuals come from outside the continent. In America, France, Great Britain have been an, uh, very good in producing those that go back to Africa and man the services, be it politics, medicine, everywhere. So you guys here have to set very good example and high standard. But on the overall, apart from remittances that you do individually to your family, which is very good, when it comes to national concerted effort from Liberia Madingo in the diaspora, I have not seen any, any satisfactory performance. Generally, there is a group uh, I want to talk about in Nigeria they call UPU, Union for the Progress of Irubo Land. And I had an opportunity to read a, a blueprint for the advancement of the Irubo people. Very valid people. Every year, Every month, they collect money. Even if it's a dollar per month, a family here will pay for each of his member, each of the members of his family. They put the money together, they go back annually into their village, into their country, and they select people and take them back into the diaspora and pay for their education. They've been doing that for the past 20 years. Now, they count the sources, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Organization has been the problem of Liberian Madingos, whether in the diaspora or in Liberia. Liberian Madingos have not been too good in respecting their leaders or their educated or intellectual class. The moment you attain some level of education and you try to exert yourself in a positive way with good ideas, you will see the crippling mentality. And I want to call it and a crap mentality because no one wants to see anyone grow. Look, I can say this for sure. Other Liberians, when their children get educated, they become their kings and queens. They respect their leader, at least in the open. That's what we know. But some of us, when God gave leadership to somebody in our community, we see that person as an elite. We see that person as not being part of us. And it's two ways. The way the person too can behave to the other people of the community, they will present to the community as somebody who is not a member. A Madingo man become a minister, he does not want to go and sit down to where he used to drink her tie. And I can say, everyone, this is why I like Captain Janet. After now, Dr. Justice Janet go back on Gallery Street and sit with us on the sidewalk and we talk. We discuss issues, regardless of his status in government as one of the senior, most senior person from our community. But some of our political leaders, some of our Liberian Madingos, when they see the same government, they just see they dare, they want to attach themselves to that group, the Madingo group. We have to stop this. 
You guys in the diaspora have to organize yourself. The Famosa thing, a very good idea. But when you look at, we read about some of the things on the internet, post about Madingo themselves, post not construct, some of them can be constructive, some of them can be for the overall good of the community, some of them can be just be mere politics. Famosa led a medical mission last year to Liberia. And we know some of the frustration that we had to face with that medical mission. We had to get involved because of this same I mean, we, the National Madingo Caucus, because of the need of preserving the cause of the Madingo people. We see good when we hear that Madingos are now thinking about carrying a medical mission back to their country. And I'm prepared this time. We are planning to see how we can work with a new team that will come next year. These are things that we should be doing. My brothers and sisters in Madingo, though, the problem that we have, we have 75% of the solution. As long as we identify the problem, being the first thing, be concerted in our efforts in uh, tackling the problem, we can make mass of, of achievements in Liberia. Mass of achievements. We have the resilience. We are acquiring the education, both from the diaspora and locally. We are brave in our forward march into mainstream Liberian society, getting involved in political activities. We are fine in every sector. But those in the diaspora now must take the lead must take the lead in good example. Stop on one another. Make sure that you raise funds for projects back home. Go to Liberia and see Liberia as your country, regardless of the fact that you carry an American passport in your bag, which is an economic asset that everyone wants. But your loyalty and your passion goes to Liberia and your economic interest is started from America just to go back to Liberia and do the best. We can make a whole lot. Nam Benaro. You see, my partner says something. Ko kone suruku ben. That means Hyena. When Hyena enter in South Africa, we keep an evil. So we got to shield ourselves from the enemy. Make the enemy feel that we are strong. They will place them in a position that they cannot enter. And if they get to know that, acceptance will be the option. And when acceptance becomes reality, then of course they can entrust our political authority. They will not want that thing. It's a, we want to be strategic. That's the, that's, that's the sum of it. We want to be strategic in everything we do. What do we want in 20 years? What do we want in 10 years? We should start asking ourselves these fundamental questions. You know, Mr. Kromar, you just said that, uh, you know, we're not sitting on the same table for you to see my facial expression, you know. But it, 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 this, is a very, this is an engagement that I want you guys every month, at least once in the month, let us identify our problems. Let's start praising one another. Let's identify the problems. Let's speak truth to one another that the problem we face in Liberia, bulk of it started from how we see ourselves, first of all, in our own motherland, and how we see ourselves in our motherland as it relate to our interaction with our fellow citizens, whether it be the Gio, Mano, Pele, Grebo, and even among ourselves as Liberian Madingos. We slap ourselves in the back by our attitude and conduct. Thank you. Uh, I've got a couple of announcements here. Uh, uh, Sometimes this, this is a special edition, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, it appears that before the end of this week, we might have another special edition with us, with the senior senator from Brown County. Uh, I'm talking of uh, Madam Joa Awatela. Uh, we, we got someone working on that. Uh, we were told today that she will most likely appear on this show Friday, uh, just like uh, uh, Nimba County Representative Number Donna did for us. So. We haven't confirmed that yet, but what, what has been confirmed is that uh, Honorable Senior, you know, m many of you know him, Senior, in Brooklyn Park, a uh, community activist, uh, a graduate of the University of Minnesota. Uh, he's going to be our regular guest on Sunday, and he's going to be talking about uh, the Truth and Reconciliation you know, uh, Committee that was set up, their founding, the pros and cons of uh, the implementation of uh, Truth and Reconciliation Report. So, Senior is here with us. Uh, 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 senior, if you had, I see you, I recognize your number here. Good evening to you. So, we'll be hosting Senior next week, Sunday. So, I'll go to the next caller here, Brother Bagali Trawali. Uh, where are you calling from for the benefit of the audience and your question, sir? Oh, thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, Bagali Trawali calling from Minnesota. Oh. Uh, Honorable Executive, welcome to America, and we are de delighted to receive you. And I think you spoke eloquently well 
on the issue. You you are able to pinpoint some of the contribution we are making as Madingo pretty much as to why we have been ostracized in the Liberian mainstream or uh, in Liberian politics as a whole. But uh, as we go along, your answers kind of like you trying to strike a balance here, making me to not to really identify your position. But nevertheless, uh, I just have a little question uh, I'd like for you to uh, enlighten our mind. Uh, Brother Jackie, I understand you are still a law. So from that perspective, I guess you you have better knowledge on a lot of uh, issues when it comes to the Madingo quote unquote uh, being set aside on other tribes. So what is say that you as a student of law know that perhaps we don't know that the government or power that be also contribute towards the setting apart the Madigo people as a whole from the rest of the the tribes in Liberia. What is it that you know sensitively that we need to know as well? That's setting, my question. What do you mean, you. Set, what do you mean setting aside? Uh, all along, we're talking about being ostracized, you, that you alluded to first, we Madrigal people. You you mentioned some of the things that we're doing that India can't be there, which is true. I agree with that 100%. On the other hand, too, what they say that you see from the power that be that's also contributing towards why they say that we are being ostracized. My old Madingo people are being ostracized. From the government perspective? Yeah, government or the power that be now or before, whatever. If you see, if you don't see anything, you... No, I understand you know. your point. I understand your point very okay. well. And I think somebody else has a similar question okay. as to okay. institutional practice or institutional policy right. that keeps the Madingo quote-unquote set aside, which I told you I don't personally believe. As a matter of fact, then you ask for, you know, the reason I ask the question, how come my law, my being a law student uh, would be relevant in answering the question? However, this is what I think, and it still constitutes my personal opinion on uh, the matter. I don't think the government of Liberia has a standing and a policy that speaks to putting aside Liberian. I don't think so. But has the government been so uh, sensitive to inclusion of all segments of the Liberian society into uh, the government? Okay, for that, I think the government has not been in a, in a satisfactorily performing when it comes to involving Madingos in the governance process. And I have spoken on that several occasions in Liberia and every forum that I have the opportunity to address that one of the ways we can sustain peace in any post-war country is for the, the, the people in the country to see themselves from their tribe, their religion, in the government, to see themselves reflected in the government. It's a very effective strategy of a post-war country, and it's one of the full definitions of social integration. Social integration speaks to an, an involvement, it speaks to an, a consultation, speaks to people being represented, apart from the fact that they even have lawmakers from their various district, but see themselves represented in the executive branch of government. The current administration have not, has not been too and as strong on that, especially the first term. Now this second term, yes, a little bit, and uh, one of the most senior government officials is a Madingo. But on the county level, County La Lofa, for example, that has a history of a tribal, on a tribal malfeasance or tribal disobedience between tribes where we have the Mandingos and the Loma having long or several years of misunderstanding, it would have been politically prudent to have both the Mandingos, the, the Kisi, the Bandi, and the major tribes of Lofa County seen at the hem of the county administration 
That has not happened for the first term of this government. That has been very sad. And we have had the opportunity to confront those and uh, that enjoy the president's ears on this. And I don't know what is happening now for this second term. I understand they just appointed a superintendent in Lofa County. The situation in Nima County, we had, I think, a deputy and a superintendent who was a Madingo sometime in the, uh, the first term of this government. I have to be clear on that. And uh, so the government on the county level and has not been very inclusive when it comes to getting Madingos involved in the administration, uh, the political administration in the county. I think uh, that has been a point that I'm not satisfied with. But as a matter of standing policy, that Madingo rights will be trampled and the government will not say anything? No, man. No, I don't think so. Okay. I'll take one more caller here, and then we'll take a short break, and we'll come back to continue from here. And uh we we are uh, well over half of the program. As you know, our programs usually run up to 11, and uh, that will be 12 to where our guest is. We have to be considerate of his busy schedule. But I'll take my next caller here, and then we'll take a quick break, and then we'll come back and pick up from where we were. Uh, leave it. So uh, I see uh, Mabel Salif made a comeback. Uh, Mr. Salif, welcome back to the Liberian Diaspora Forum. Your question, man. Hello? Hello? Yeah, yeah, you are on. You are, you are on the show. Yes, um, once again, Mabiam Salif calling from Upper Derby, Pennsylvania. Um, yes. With respect to the integration of the Madingo uh, ethnic group in Liberia, the big elephant in the room needs to be addressed. And the big elephant, I mean, relinquishing the Madingo women to excel to the optimum ability in terms of education in particular. You touched it a little bit, Honorable, but it was not sufficient. This subject is, I mean, I'm extremely passionate about promoting the causes of the Madingo community to support the Madingo girls to go to school. And the ill philosophy of, quote unquote, Muso John Ely is ill. It's not, it's detrimental to the progress of Madingo in society. Because take, for example, Madingo women, they fight that they are not even educated. They struggle day and night, and their success, success is unprecedented. So why not let the Madingo women go to school, respect them as, as human beings, let them go to school, achieve education, and be somebody in the Liberian government as well, or in Mandingo, uh, Liberian society as well. Not to know, for example, I can tell a personal story. When I was going to school, every, every semester I went on campus, I saw a Mandingo girl, the next semester she's not coming. What happened? She got married. The other folks telling me, oh, well, you're not Mandingo. You've been here for the longest. That's the philosophy other people have of us, and that philosophy needs to change. The Madingo Society needs to support the Madingo women to go to school because why I am absolutely out for female power specifically to the Madingo ethnic group. Because other other tribes respect the the the, the importance of education and we All can right. see it. So thank okay, you very much. That's a subject I'm passionate about and I look forward okay. to my answer. All thank right, you. make another entry, make a follow up. Okay. Uh, 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 uh Mr Jackita, you can uh you can uh, comment on that, or you can you can do it now after the break. Your choice, sir. What would you like to do? Let me, let me just uh, comment on that. I agree with my I agree with him very okay. well. That uh, we have to do we have to do more when it comes to how we see our sisters, how we see our mothers. And this is very important. However, I come back again to the way our girls will proceed in enjoying the emerging freedom. In Monrovia, we give whole week, one week on my program, we call it dedicated to the women. I try all to, to have a single Madingo woman to sit on the show to talk. I couldn't find. I mean, woman, a very Madingo woman, in Monrovia, to say something about the challenges faced by cultural practice, vis-a-vis the integration of women into a liberal society when it comes to working, education, and the rest of them. Yes, my being, you are right. We have to give our sisters, our daughters, our wives the opportunity to excel. We have to be the pooch 
we have to understand that the world is changing. Musabra Kei Jondi, Atei Jondi, those philosophy has to be restrictive. However, why are we giving them that right and that support? They also have to be conscious of their cultural of their responsibility within the context of the Madengo culture. The Nigerian ambassador in Liberia, and I asked her this question. I said, will you allow your gecha or your bocha to cook? She said, no, there are some natural rules. The gecha will be pleasant. It will look good to see the gecha cooking, and it will look good to see the bocha you know, searching the firewood. Okay, that is consistent with the African culture. And to practice that does not mean anything bad. There are some good side of our culture that can go along with uh, the contemporary practice of civilization, there are some basa that we have to leave behind. And some of the basa that we have to leave behind is the fact that we're giving our daughters, our wives, our sisters the opportunity to accept does not place them in the position to see themselves as Westerner, does not place them in the position to also relinquish or abuse the opportunity that have been afforded. But we have been really, really unfair to them on the overall. We have suggested them to the back seat. It's about time that we bring them side by side and let them also take that as a privilege. Although it's a right, but let them take that as a privilege to some extent, and then be very respectful, be courteous, and be madingo to some extent. Okay, please Thank go you. nowhere. We'll be back after this short break here. Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being there. So here is our 
Uh, no name, your last four digits, 0940, where are you calling from? Your name and your question. 0940, 0940, your name, where are you calling from and your question? Are you there? Six. Six zero three eight two zero zero oh, nine forty. Okay. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. This is Samuel Sture Jakite. Yeah, would, would you please call your name to the audience? Where are you calling from? Your question, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Samuel S. Ture from Concord, New Hampshire. Welcome, Mr. Ture. Yeah, thank you. Your question. Yeah, yeah your question. Okay. Uh, Mr. Jackie, uh, thank you very much for you know coming on this talk show, and uh, your presentation is very you know it's very uh, uh, understandable. So uh, I am you know concerned about this issue. You know, some of us have been out of Liberia for a long, long time, and uh, we see that uh, you know uh, some of our brothers if they go over there, you know, and uh, they have issues, you know, entering Liberia living from Guinea to go to Liberia, and they have issues, you know, to enter Liberia. So I want to know what you guys are over there, what are you guys doing in order to, you know, alleviate the kind of issue that is facing while entering in Liberia from Guinea? Thank you. You're welcome. Some, that's, a, that's a very tricky question. First of all, I have not heard of anybody who has been denied entrance or entry into Liberia on the basis of tribe, especially from Guinea. Uh, sometime uh, last year, there was a closure. Our border with Guinea was closed for some time, I think, from the Guinean side. But I have not heard in recent time, and uh, I'll tell you something, if it happens in Liberia or it happens and it concerns Liberia, and I am among the few people in Liberia that uh, privilege to get the information. Uh, this has not been brought to my know in any way, and I don't know, I've never heard, I've never read of anybody being denied entry on the basis of being a Madingo man. Perhaps it will be on the basis of documentation. Sometimes it can be wrongly said. But uh, shortly, a uh, short uh, answer, I think uh, I've not heard it. Because you have to hear something before you do something about it. And uh, if you know anybody who has been denied entry into Liberia on the basis of their tribe, you bring that to our attention, we will, you know, we'll bring it into the public glare for this course. But we inform the appropriate authority and to see what can be done about it. We, you are, we, don't suppose, we, we, are, we are not supposed to sit on some of this information. We have the medium to which we can get redress. Even we can get it to the court. We can bring it to the media. And I can tell you, it has been working. Most of the thing we brought we brought in the media has uh, at least received some attention from the state. And so uh, some of the things at times can be just rumor, like during the voter registration, somebody will stay in Ganta and say, oh, they deny 500 Malabrema Madingos. When you go there and do the robust investigation, you'll find perhaps only three or four. You know, sometimes the way the news go to, uh, like I can remember specifically for Bon County, uh, we got the information that over 200 Madingos were denied. You know, so we, we were very excited. Okay, well, now we got some proof. And uh, I can remember Mustafa Kamara, the former deputy minister, we called him, we appealed to him to go there, being a senior member of the community. And he went to Bon County. He returned with just nine names. And who had those nine names we went to find out? We found that two of them realistically were not like Brema Dingos, and the others could not in any way answer the basic question of where they were living in Bon County. And uh, so some of these things, when we get the information, we have to do the background check. You know, but also we know about some instances where somebody were asked to speak their dialect and they spoke the dialect. Then when the Madingo person comes, they say, speak your dialect, the person speaks your dialect, they say, you're not Liberia, you know. So it then makes. It then makes. I'm not trying to, you know, just start to be say that uh, everything then rules it. It then makes. But it will get better. I trust you, Liberia will get better, my brother. 
Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm with Jackie there. Well, oh, man, I got so many questions to you in the queue for you. Uh, let me take a, I want to take you away uh, slightly, you know, from uh, the, the, the main thing that we've been discussing here tonight. Uh, uh, the, doing one of our last, uh, our, our very last special edition of, of this program with uh, Nimba County District Number 7 Representative Donor. Uh, he took a lot of his about the land dispute, since you fire, you know, he's a representative from Nimba County. And, and so another thing that came out during that, that debate, that discussion, was that uh, there were too many accusing fingers pointed at your boss, Musa Berete, for having occupied himself with too many positions, uh, one of which happens to be the chairman for the Land uh, Dispute Commission. And so because of his uh, uh, overwhelming engagement, uh, a lot of callers you know, asserted that uh, he, that he's not effective with the land dispute, the land dispute resolution. Uh, do you agree with that assertion? Do you have any comment on that? Oh, I think the land committee, the land and uh, the committee set up by the president and uh, to uh, prove the Nimba land dispute completed its works. It was an ad hoc committee that was set up and chaired by uh, Ms. Pabilite. The committee presented its findings, its recommendations, and for me, that constituted the end to the work, and I entrusted to the committee. Now, the responsibility shifts to the state to implement the recommendation of the committee, and the committee recommendation, and uh, I think a few months ago, they started doing payments and recommended by the committee and, uh, to those people occupying the property and uh, that refused to go, they would give money. So I think you know, you know the rest of the story. So to uh, directly say that uh, uh, because of this uh, quote-unquote uh, several engagement with state business and uh, the SA is a reason for the prolonged and uh, state of the resolution of the Nimbaland situation will be a very unfair and a comment. What I can say is that uh, the government of Madame Salif has not been uh, very swift and, uh, and proactive, has not been very maybe we use a stronger word, serious, in bringing this land issue and, uh, to finality, finality because of the political nature of the situation, given the fact that we are going, we are going close to election. Uh, you know, Madam President, being a politician, will be very sensitive on how to satisfy one group against the other. So politics was finding its way into the land situation. But the responsibility now goes to the government to make sure that uh, it implements or carry out the recommendation by the committee. The committee did a very fine job. I read the recommendation. There are some points that I disagree with. I think nobody should be compensated for their wrong. If you are wrong, you are wrong. You cannot use uh, and, uh, the situation of the war and then uh, uh, move on people's property and refuse to leave it. But the committee said that uh, you know, history is replete with, with uh, post and a war situation where people fight for land, where land dispute become an issue. And everybody used different model in resolving their various uh, land crisis and land issues and uh, in post-war countries. So they sought uh, to use the the compensation model and as a way of uh, solving the problem. And uh, the, I think the government put some money in the budget for that purpose. The payment started, but uh, I think Baganta, which been the very last era, has not been effectively uh, taken care of. But I think it's going on. But to blame the committee, look, let me tell you, the government has not been very serious on handling that animal land thing. And for all those reasons, you. you know. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take the next question, the next caller here. Uh, no name, last four, DJ 8405. Where are you calling from? Your name and your question. 8405. Hi, my name is Hassan Shari, um, former President of Lima, Philadelphia. Welcome, welcome Hassan Shari. Your question, sir. Well, I just want to take out. Uh, I uh, want to welcome Mr. Kavar Jagide. Welcome, thank you. Um, <clears throat> my question is, with regard to, uh, you know, when I came in, somebody was talking about integration into the Liberian community, but the Madingo people, uh, in terms of representation with the government. My question is, Liberia is comprised of, I think, sixteen ethnic groups. Do we know the percentage of Madingo or? or Group in Liberia, like what percentage of, Mading, of the Madingo population makes up the Liberian national population compared to other people? And take that statistic 
compared to our representation in government. What I'm trying to say, do we have any statistic in Liberia that enumerate the number of people? Okay. You say you understand your question, Mr. Sharif. Is that it? That's that's yeah. That's my question. Like, if we have any statistic in Liberia that has enumerated the number of public, like our appellate people comprise of this percentage of the population, by and such such, but then if we know that because you know, I don't want us to look at it like we are not being represented in government. So you know, that's okay. that's my area of contention. You know, as we okay. the other ethnic group. Thank you, Mr. Thank He's you, making yeah. reference to proportional representation in government. Right. Uh, we I have think not that's been able to do. Yeah, 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 we have not been able to do an, uh, any scientific analysis of uh, representation in government. But if that is done, there are some tribes in Liberia that are not in the, the biggest seats in the government. Uh, but we are so fortunate as a community to have at least one or two, you know, in the higher level. Uh, so a direct answer to your question is, I, I don't know what is the percentage of Madengos in Liberia. And uh, to give you a proportional uh, representation in percentage in government, that I can see. And uh, the point I think he's trying to raise is that I think we should have reason to say we are lucky. If we compare uh, other tribes that don't have even a single minister, <laughs> I think that's what I'm trying to deduce and get from his comment. But that does not in any way, you know, uh, point to the fact that uh, because we are minority and then we should have all other tribes as minister. There are some strategic positions in government that is not at the ministerial level, but you can be of great help to your people. For example, the deputy police director for operation runs the Liberian National Police. And then we don't expect that you use that position to the... Uh, disadvantage of other tribe, but uh, we we'll see him as a kind of, uh, you know, feeling that we are represented in the security sector uh, without expecting any you know, payback. As I can see, we have a Madingo man, so, okay, let me go and then uh, drive recklessly on the street, then I don't get, you know, anything else to do. You know, so that's, that's the point. So we have, to be, we have to be very sensitive to all of these issues. Okay. Uh, um, well, I... As a reminder, we have uh, 34 minutes left for this show, and uh, uh, it is my intention to end this show exactly at 11 o'clock. It's 10.26, so we, I believe we got uh, 34 minutes to go. So I'll take the next question here. Uh, Mr. Moyubility, where are you calling from in your question, sir? Yeah, uh, I'm calling from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, good evening, Honorable Jackie uh, This is my question. When asked by someone as to what uh, you have done, I mean our leaders, or are doing to make sure that Liberian Matingos are represented in various governmental status or in other sectors of the Liberian society, you mentioned your efforts during the restructuring process of the Liberian National Police and said that most of our brothers left because of financial greed or because of monetary demands. Uh, some of them are in the garages, some of them are loading cars, what you decided to do then when they when they left their duty and what are you doing now? Or what do you think we should be done? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bilete. Okay, uh, Mr. 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 Bilete, personally, apart from the one or two persons that I helped, I've not done, I've been very frank with you, I've not done anything. Anything to the extent I say, okay, since you left the police or you left the police training or the army training, I'm finding you something else to do. I've not been able to do it. I run a Madingo program on the radio every Saturday. They call Jerry and Co. And it's a program where we play the my Madingo music and then we call in guests to discuss issues affecting the community. I use that platform to encourage our people to be positive. I use that platform to encourage them to leave drugs. I use that platform and uh, to portray the good image that we have been long noted for. If you see a Madingo girl or boy drinking Henneken by the roadside, you know, now in Monrovia, it's not something big. But before then, when we were coming up, that was something very, very unexpected. In fact, I even say you're a Madingo man doing the type of thing, it was not compatible. 
You see, so in our own way, way, you know, yes, we can use our Vera platform, you know, to help conscientizing them to be better citizens. But apart from that, we've not done anything. At the level of the National Madingo Caucus, as you already know, I'm the, uh, the Secretary General of the National Madingo Caucus. We've tried from the perspective of providing scholarship. At the moment, uh, our scholarship was one of the effective, most effective uh, program at the University of Liberia, apart from the Gigi Rabo Scholarship and two other scholarships, were consistent with our payment. We had students with 1.8 GPA Mandingos that were paying school fee for just to encourage them to be academic, encourage them in the scholarly fee. That was that is our community effort from the level of the National Mandingo Caucus. See, so everybody has to do his or part based on your own domain and your own opportunity, your own right. But I tell you no lie, the situation with some of our brothers, not all of them, there are some of them that are doing very well. The last time I heard a Madingo girl was contesting for senior club prefect in one of the uh, high schools in Monrovia. And, and I went and talked to her, personally called her. And you know, she's not too eloquent. She's not the A student. But the fact that she braved the opportunity, you know, to even throw in her opportunity, to even throw in the towel, to, to say, okay, I want to run, I'm contesting, challenging men, that was unprecedented. And I felt so good. I encouraged her. And I gave her what I could give her at the time. But she didn't win. But those are things that we must do. Those are things that we can do. And some of us should try to continue to do. Uh, I have an unusual request here. Uh, this is unusual because uh, uh, this is our ninth show, and obviously this program, the Liberian Diaspora Pro, uh, Forum, is a very new program. It started August 20th, immediately after the end of Ramadan, and we've never had this kind of request before. I have a very unusual request here. On our Facebook page, and my phone here, the, the, the text message, there the, the, the are a couple of listeners here who have expressed the opinion that they profoundly disagree with our guest position on the Madingos not being, you know, institutionally uh, uh, alienated, you know, as foreigners. And so they fight that they don't know how much time our guest, uh, you know, uh, a guy has to be in the U.S. They don't know when your departure date is, but they would like to debate this issue with you. They profoundly disagree. They think there are some institutional discrimination against Madingo people in Liberia. Having said that, you can get back to me with that now on this show, but I'll take the next caller here. Uh, uh, but Mr. Ishmael Kumara, your uh, uh, your question, sir. Mr. Kumara? Ishmael yes, Kumara? Yes. yes. Uh, you are, you are well, on the, you are on the air, your question. Yeah, uh, this is a follow-up question to Brother Jagite. Brother Jagite, you first of all uh, answer, attempt to answer the question and I think I'm not sure what I was very clear when I asked the question in the, on the uh, question of institutional bias. And you said there are instances where we might find our people discriminated against, but the issue of the imam, wherein there was an encounter with an immigration officer, and but besides that, you also agree that you were traveling with a woman, uh, and that woman, the kind of questions that you were asked was not in fact appropriate. And the very few that are asking a question are government officials and elements that, uh, that are part of the government. Will you consider that uh, to be part of institutional bias? No, it's a straight question. No, I won't consider that institutional bias. Say, Tim, what is institutional bias? You know, the, 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 the action or isolated action of members of an institutional does not characterize it as an institutional bias. You cannot tell me that the immigration of Liberia has an institutional policy against Madingos. Specifically, that's my point. I'm not saying it can happen or it has not been happening, but to call it an institutional policy. And Chroma, which one of the web page you're, you're talking about that say they want us to debate it? And we can plan it if it's something, you know. No, and I'm when not, I say debate it. The Liberian Diaspora Forum has a, a Facebook page set up. So some of our listeners here have sent me text messages and also sent a request, uh, message me that, you know, they don't know how much time you got remaining in the U.S., 
but that whether it's in the U.S. or it's no, in it's, Liberia, uh, as, as, as you very well know, we hosted Ali Sila on this same show while he was in Liberia. You know, he just called him like he do it, and he was our guest a couple of weeks ago. It went great. So these guys are saying that they profoundly disagree. They believe that uh, they, are, they are more than institutional, you know, uh, the discrimination, alienation in Liberia, and that the way you're portraying it, they are not very pleased with that. They like to debate the issue with you, uh, if you if you permit them. Uh, okay, Mr. Mr. Kumar, so, you know, yeah, listen, yeah. I, I, I did not take up this opportunity to, you know, to talk about disagreement. Disagreement in a democracy is fundamental. I can disagree, disagree with my point. Everything I've seen and uh, constitute my personal insight on the issue. Okay. And I must repeat this. I don't believe the Liberian government has an institutional position of alienation against Liberian language. No. That is not what I believe. I okay, know... let's take the next... Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah we'll take the next... Uh, we, don't have, we don't have much time. I'll take the next question. I got, I got too many questions in the time and fast span. I'll take... Uh, let's conclude with your questions and go back to the line. All right. Uh, by the way, uh, the next caller here was our guest on this same show yesterday. He's uh, Honorable Randolph Asmana Randolph Jabate of Limani website. He was our our guest on the regular program yesterday. He spoke on uh, uh, on uh, Madingo Unity. So he's the next caller. Uh, Honorable Asmana Jabate, where are you calling from in your question, sir? Uh, I'm calling from New York, and uh, just one statement. Uh, I think the major problem we have in Liberia is the Maningo Caucus. And according to the Unity Maningo Caucus, they have blind eyes to everything. All I can say is that when we correct that, I think the Maningo can move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Any, any, do you care to comment on that, uh, Mr. Jackita? Well, Mr. Mr. Bato has said it all. He said we, when we care to. So let him join us. Let all of us do it together. I think he has identified the single serious problem facing the Grand Madingo is the Madingo Caucus. If that is the case, I'll tell you then our problem finished today. We're going to dissolve the Madingo Caucus right away, and then let's see how it continues. But I don't think so. I think it's beyond that. And you say the unity of Madingo Caucus. I think that is not fair. If he understands what the Madingo Caucus stands for and what we attempt to resolve, uh, to better appreciate that, then uh, you will get a different opinion. But to say the only problem we have is the Madingo Caucus, I think Mr. Kumar, let's go further and then discuss. If he has specific issues, say the Madingo Caucus day A was wrong, the day B was wrong, then we can discuss it. But that uh, characterization was too generous. It was too general. Okay. Let me make it specific. All right, uh, next caller, I see Brother Lusuni Saka made a comeback. Uh, Brother Saka, welcome back to the Liberian Diaspora Forum. Your question, sir. Oh, thank you, Kafumba. Um, Brother Jagite, we have, um, we have here some uh, complaint in some quarters uh, from some people that, um, that the Madingo caucus um, have uh, marginalized the larger Madingo community and uh, pretty much care about... Um, their own personal and political interests, and you being associated with the Madingo Caucus, how do you respond? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saka. Um, where, where do I start from? Okay, first of all, my brother, that statement is not true, that the Madingo Caucus has, quote-unquote, marginalized and uh, the other Madingo, larger Madingo community. You know, we've been having this problem of people saying Madingo Koko is an elite club, it's a gas seller association, and uh, it's an organization that is bent on, quote-unquote, protecting their own interests. But if you go further and ask them, give me specifics, there is stop. It's an earnest effort. The Madingo Koko is an earnest effort to solve small of the problem of the Madingo community. Just small. But in the face of all that... We still face unnecessary criticism, not constructive, stopping from the back. People just sit there and have a perception. There is a group they call the Liberian Madingo, uh, the, the Madingo Concern Madingo Society of Liberia. At the onset, there was this misunderstanding, but now we work together. 
We want people that can come on the table. Come with your issues. Come and look in the face of them. This is wrong. Let's do it this way. Don't sit on the roadside and then find problem. I'm tired answering questions about Madingo Cocos being an elite organization said by Madingos that have all right, that can walk to our meetings, make contribution, or say something. And this is the same problem I identify as our problem is from ourselves. We are good at criticizing. When it comes to finding solution, we don't see nobody. But I can tell you the Madingo Cocos mean well, sincerely well. You know the reason we did not support any of the candidates in the past election? Because we never wanted to place our people in similar situation of 2005. Where it is widely believed that few persons benefited from our lives. So this year, last 2011, we made a conscious decision. Since we have Madingos that are seditions, we have Madingos that are in UP and other political party. everybody goes to where you find your strength and then work to make your party win. After the election, we'll come back and sit as brothers and identify our problems and move forward. Why should we have a Madingo organization that professes to be in the interest of the larger Madingo community adopt an institutional policy to ostracize the bulk of the Madingo community? National Madingo Coco is not a political party seeking presidency. It's not an organization that collects money and derives money. It is an organization that serves as a forum of Madingos in Liberia to find to find solution to our problems, the issue of education that we provide in scholarship, we find some of our community members that are in distress, we go to their aid if it's in our know. These are the things that we intend to do. The guys from Musa will not tell you that we abandoned them when they went with the American mission. We took the responsibility to, to work with them in the name of Madingo Dom, in the name of our culture and our unity. We opened doors that they could not open. We gave them facility. We took their containers from the port. We store it. We work with them. Our district, our, our, our representative the district, work with them. We organized dinner for them. You know, we did it not because they're from America. We did it in the name of our Madingo identity. But yesterday, people see that the National Madingo Cocoa is an elite club. Yes, if that's the case. It's never a bad thing to be seeing yourself as elite, which I disagree with, though. Many of us say, but we just, we just sarcastically respond to them that way. The Madeo Corps is a serious organization that means a whole lot positively for the Madeo community and that has a vision to rescue this community from the misconception in the Liberian community and advance the Madeo cause at the larger, uh, larger, larger Liberian political stage for the good of our people. It is not intended to devour like the brother is saying, ostracize. For what gain? What reason would Justice Janet have to ostracize? What reason would Musa Bede, what reason would Lusani Kamara? Most of the creme de la creme of our community are members of the National Madingo Caucus because they see themselves, our other Madingo brothers, perhaps. You logically see that position or status that most of the leadership of Manigo Cocos occupy as a basis, not to see themselves part of it. It's okay, these are gas seller, politicians, money people, business. Let me go far from it. But yesterday, we are not seeing ourselves like that. I am not a quote unquote elite. I'm a regular Monrovia board, Madingo man, that see myself part of the National Manigo and being entrusted with a secretary position with people that I call my father. That I see, Los Alicamar does not want anything for anybody in the bureau. He's not a politician. He's running for no office. But when he called me, he said, Lebomadi, we have to do this. What happened to the scholarship program? He was running his own scholarship program for his brother, a uh, member of his brother. He said, okay, I will transfer that phone to the Manigo Coco Scholarship. And he's doing that. So what else can we do and stop this crap mentality of criticizing anything that is Madingo? How long will we go with this mentality instead of coming on board? You stay in the backyard and just throw the stone and put your hand in your pocket as nothing happened. This unnecessary envy that has a denial of our rightful position in the community must be curtailed. And some of us, we are prepared. And let me say this. If Madingo Cocoa is the problem to our foremost, we dissolve it. Come on the table with your idea. 
If a Musa is the problem, for our four as a community, we post up to A. Bring the alternative that you have and let us move in a single direction for the, for the good of our community and the good of our country. We are not, Madingo Kokos does not oppose any Madingo organization. As long as you are a Madingo, even 10% Madingo blood, we see you as a member of the National Madingo Caucus. And when you are in trouble, nobody in Moriba that can come in trouble and they come to the Madingo Caucus, we will turn our back to you. Let's manage your person. I don't want to be an uh, sounding uh, so boastful, but we know we can call names of people that we have come to the aid. When the, when the Lofa County thing happened and Madingos were in jail, who stood their bone? Who, who found lawyer for them? The court people were aware of that. We did. We didn't do that. And we had some situation where even the position of one of our members, Justice Janet, was brought under to national question because some people believe that he did something wrong. We collected money, found the lawyers, found the bond, negotiated with everything legally, and we got their release. Today, they are, they, they, they are out of jail. Did they do that because we see them as elite? Some of us risk our national political relevance in the name of this Madingo thing. Okay, Instead bro, of saying, bro, gentlemen, bro. You are, thank you. Let me conclude on this. We have to stop this thing. We have to stop this thing. It won't take us anywhere. I'm not here to outline the gains of National Madrigal Caucus. I know it has challenges. It has organizational challenges. It has institutional challenges. It has funding challenges. It has problems. But the intent is good. That goodness that is in the intent is what we should go for. It's what we should develop. It's what we should work on. What is happening in the Madingo Association here in Liberia, in America, like Samusa and other and the smaller organizations, the intent is good. It's to bring people together. It's not to divide people. Stop the name calling. Stop saying the negative things about yourselves. All right. You know, sometimes when I talk uh, about no, this no, thing, no, I become no. so... No, no, Kruma. <laughs> Let us change the situation. This is okay. not fair. And to the extent that it, American like Madingos in America, that we expect it to be people who see the good side of things more than the negative thing. Because you guys are in the diaspora, you have access to better education, understanding your comprehension level is serious and is very, very strong. So start pointing at the Monrovia, Gala Street, and Jacobtown gossip. It's not fair. Okay, we have to leave it there, Mr. Uh, the, the architect. Uh, I got a few more qu uh, questions here. So. Uh, folks, we have just uh, 14 minutes remaining to the end of this show here. Uh, there's no question about it. It's been an excellent show. Uh, it's everything we expected, I will argue. So uh, before I take the next caller, though, uh, given all of what you've just said about Madingo Caucus, uh, I'm, 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 I'm left to wonder what a, what a Madingo Caucus did, anything, uh, and I mean anything for that matter with respect to Imam Asu, uh, uh, no, not to my knowledge. Not to my also, knowledge. Of, and not to, no, let in that regard. no. Yeah. You know, there are two ways to yeah. work. Okay. <coughs> Sometimes you will do some things that will remain in the back. Sometimes you do something that will come to the public. There are so many things Madingo Koko has done in the past that has not been brought to the public glare. And I can say some of them here. On this okay. question about the, uh, the, uh, the beating of the guy, they sent me the email and I saw the photos from uh, the public agenda news support. And I've talked to people at the immigration people. If I ask Joel Sandor about this, I gave the immigration commissioner the number of Joel Sandor. He's available. You can call him. And they call him to ask him a few questions of the guys. And I know what I, and the immigration people are told and I was making it a subject on my show if they are not taking stance on it. And we know what they did. Oh, my brother, they're not everything you bring to the public glare and make quote-unquote issue ever. I'm not in any way saying that was not a primary issue or a major issue. But sometimes, the way, you know, dog politics, you know how dogs will swim in the water? You see the hair going smooth. But if you see the feet of the dog in the water, it's fighting, but the hair is just going smooth. You see, you're like safari the dog is on. But okay. I'll, 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 take the, I'm fine with I'll take the next call, call out here. Uh, 0940, you better come back, man, and I forgot your name. Would you please tell us your name, where you're calling from, and your question hey. again? Uh, your question, 0940. Who the conference call? 0940? Is that me? Yeah, oh. if it's, is that your number, your last four digits, 0940? Oh, okay, it's not you. Okay, yeah, that's me. 
Yeah, would uh, you please call, tell us your name again and where you're calling from there, your question. Uh, Mr. Jackie T, uh, this is uh, Samu S. Turek calling from Concord, New Hampshire again. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, this is uh, a very good uh, discussion, you know, and uh, it brings, uh, you know, unity and solidarity, you know, so that we can uh, tackle issues in the community. Uh, but uh, uh, my problem here is this. Uh, uh, you know, some of us uh, have left uh, Liberia for a long time, and uh, in anything that we want to do or we want to invest in, we have to do a uh, community needs assessment. And uh, you are there. You know the issue. And uh, so what do you think, you know, strategy-wise, what do you think, you know, is there as an access or opportunity and strength so that we, the Madingo in diaspora, you know, can help to, uh, you know, empower our people <coughs> back home that will give, you know, competitive advantage to our people in Liberia. Madingo in general now. So what do you think? <laughs> Famu, you asking the same question. <laughs> you asking the same question you asked me several, several, several weeks ago. Okay, no? I think like I yeah, I'm hearing you. You getting me? Hello? Yeah, you yeah, hear me? Go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Kuma, I say, uh, Famo, Famo yeah. giving his own background, you know, I think that that is good. We need, we need, a, we need to do a need assessment. Where do we need to uh, target our, you know, our little resources in advance in our people? But personally, what I think we really need to build the capacity of our people, uh, meaning education. Uh, we are many of our homes now. We see uh, people going to school, but uh, the possibility of ending, you know, the chances of ending the, has not been too high. I don't know for what we seen. Perhaps we can commission a study that will identify the, the problems uh, confronting the Madingo as it relate to, you know, completing first of all high school, little on college, and then a graduate school. You know, if you take uh, the law school, for example, when I uh, was there, we took just, I think, six, seven Madingos. <laughs> that was so, that's, that's so low. And before we, before the end of the study, we had just four. So what is the problem? Why are we not going beyond sixth grade, going beyond ninth grade, going beyond high school, entering college? And so the need to an identify study that will move in in the community and then give for a holistic, you know, a, a holistic picture of the problems and then give recommendations on how they can be solved. It's very okay. required, very needed. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we want to thank you for being here. we got nine minutes left uh, tonight. We had the privilege of uh, uh, having a, a very frank conversation with our brother, friend, and the leader, uh, brother, uh, uh, Mr. Mamadi Jakite, the hottest talk show host in Liberia at the moment. Uh, he's in the U.S. Uh, he came as part of uh, President Ali Johnson Salif delegation to the United Nations. He's expected to return sometime next week. Uh, <clears throat> everything we say here tonight is recorded. If you need to access the recording at any time, uh, by all means, please die. Uh, five five nine seven two six one two nine nine, and the same access call you dare to come to the conference. You know, we'll let you listen to the recorded version of it. Uh, and also, as, as 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 you know, this show is uh, air every Sunday. That's our normal programming. And so, comes this coming, come Sunday of this week, we will have the honor of uh, honorable uh, senior. Actually, he just made a request to ask a question. So. My next guest here uh, will be our guest this coming Sunday, and he's going to be speaking on the need for the implementation of uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee's report in Liberia. So you'll be talking on that. And uh, before Sunday, it is possible we could have uh, the senior senator from Bond County. I'm talking of, uh, I'm talking of uh, Madam uh, Joy Howard Taylor. We could have her uh, make an appearance for us you know, before Sunday. We will let you know as soon as we confirm that. But for now, what is confirmed is that Senor will be our guest this Sunday. Speaking of Senor, uh, here's the here's the here's the man, uh, Mr. Senor. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, welcome to the Liberian Diaspora Forum. Uh, yeah, where are you calling from for the benefit of the audience and the audience and your question, sir? I'm calling from Broken Park, Minnesota. I don't have a question, but I would like to just make a brief remark just before you close, if that's okay with you. Yeah, uh, just uh, just gotta be brief, so we can accommodate other people. If you keep it brief, that should be fine, sir. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I'll maybe take 30 seconds or so. No, I just wanted to uh, thank you for the forum and also uh, thank your, your guest for his articulation and uh, listening. I think I'm ready for Sunday. I'm convinced that you have an engaged audience and I look forward to our fruitful and healthy discussion. I just wanted to announce myself that I was on through at the conference. Thank you so much for inviting me and I look forward to Sunday. I can't tell you how delighted I am that you announced yourself. Uh, that's that's very uh, excellent of you. So, folks, as you heard, uh, we're going to have a very important, uh, very eloquent, you know, guest uh, come Sunday. So, come ready for come ready for Mr. Sam. I'll take the next caller here, uh, Mr. Vaboli Kamara. Where are you calling from? And your question. Uh, please be brief. We just got six minutes remaining. Uh, thank Mr. you Kamara. very much. Uh, yeah, I'm Babali Kamara calling from Bridge Center, Minnesota. Uh, welcome, Mr. Jack T. Uh, I want to ask you, I'm going to deviate from the topic you are discussing concerning your, uh, but before that, I'll make a little comment. I think the problem with, uh, I recall, Madigo, Kogos, Morovia, are looking at it to be a problem of individual leadership. You know, one way or somebody is an advocate, at the same time, the person, you know, it business partner with uh, the backing of government or is looking for position. I think that's the problem that we're having with Manigo leadership. I think the Liberian uh, the Manigo community need a good, a defined leadership in Liberia. If you want to be an advocate for Manigo, that would be fine. But you cannot be two things at the same time. You know, that's what I'm looking at. It. And don't get angry with us, you know, because one time we see somebody as an advocate, the same person will appear to us again to be a partner with a uh, uh, some leadership of government. Uh, thank you very much. My question here is this. You know, we have friends in the economic sector in Liberia working with the various banks, and they are telling us, oh, your sisters or your mothers are good business people. And they come to the bank, LBD or Echo Bank, whatsoever, to getting money from there. And giving money to these this people and taking loans from the LBD, you know, going to do business, probably so, and they are going to Hong Kong or Dubai or China. And with our proper small business enterprise, you know, education. And same time, you know, they see people come here for vacation, they tell us, they say, hey, we gave thirty thousand dollars to your sister, but she turned around and gave her five thousand in cash as a bribe for as a thank you. And in less than six months, most of their most of their business go underwater. And this is reflecting negative, you know, on the, on our community, you know, uh, in in Liberia. Because most of the businesses that when small business that are uh, going underwater is for our side. Don't you think, Mr. Jack, it would be good to know that uh, Manigo Kogos help our sisters, our mothers, you know, with some sort of small business education skill? You see, I'm very concerned about it because people love us in the diaspora. As you say, you know, we have to do something to be able to help our people and do so on whatsoever. You know, uh, empower our people to offer proper education, giving them loan, you know, offer proper education, how to balance their book and all the issues. Don't you think, you know, it's the time as a journalist, you need to talk to some of people in our community so that they can come out with some formula before people go and get some of these things so that they can educate them how to do business instead of giving okay. part of that request? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kamara. Uh, that's a loaded question. Did you get that, Mr. Yeah. Jackita? Yeah, I, I think I agree with him. I think he, he's contributing, you know. He's okay. asking for something that... Uh, all of us can look on to. I think he identified a problem. He said our sisters are getting loan and they don't have the business skill in a contemporary world to manage their business. Have you, have you heard about the GOMASA 10,000 Women Program? And uh, mm -hmm. that is a program that trains you know, young entrepreneurs, Liberian market women, and how to calculate their profit, their losses, and how to you know bank how to withdraw and basic business management. And in that program, I've had the opportunity to interact with the uh, the funders and the operators of the program. I've not seen many Mandingos and uh, uh, young business women participating in our literacy program. I think this is important. Uh, this is a message that we appreciate and welcome. I will take it back to the leadership. 
and then let's see how we can encourage our sister, even if not the Madengo Caucus organizing such program, we can encourage them to join the GOMASAC, the 10,000 women in the GOMASAC program to register, to go on that six month, one year, 18 months training. You know, these are the type of things that we, we expect people to do. Come with an idea, recommend something, and then start seeing the ugly side continuously. And on the other issue of leadership, yes, I agree. Madengo Caucus has a challenge. We have not had, and an, 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 uh, we have most ability for a very long time to have been there. Personally, I think he means well. He has expressed his intention to go to elections. He's working on that. But whenever election times are near, something will happen. Karim was the one who was supposed to organize his first sick. And later on, we were in, uh, you know, some uh, sympathy with his status, so we couldn't go through. Another time, the situation of elections around the corner. So we're going to have a problem with leadership. I agree. That we can work on. Those are the type of things I want us to talk about, Mr. Kruman. You know, yeah, let's but you, know, know, you, know, you know, let me a quick follow up, though. I think the way the way he, he laid the premise before asking this question was that leadership, you know, leadership issue was here, was one of the issues he raised. But another thing he was concerned about was the fact that Madingo Caucus role has not been very clear. Sometimes they, they pretend as advocate for our people. But Other times they that. align. All the time they align with the same people they were advocating against yesterday. So which is which? No, no, no. He said he said the leadership of the Madingo Caucus rule has not been clear, especially when it comes to the president. That one time he's a businessman, another time he's an advocate. I don't know when Mr. Bellity has been dangling in his approach. He has been very clear. He said he's a friend of the president and he supports Madame Salif. Issue that has to do with Madingos. When it's come to the new of the Madingo Caucus, he has authorized us to make statements. Sometimes he makes statements, and he has been consistent on that. I have not seen Mr. Bedele one time supporting this party or another time supporting another party. He has always been a pro-unity party supporter, and he has told us in open meeting that he's not a member of the unity party, but of course he's a friend of the president. And I even talked that to him one time. I said, you're not a member of your party, your committee chairman. He said, that is possible. You know, so everything on Mr. Bedele, his personal political style has been very clear to us. He's a unity partisan. We have people in the leadership that are for CVC. There are just few people that have not identified a political link. Remember, Jack said, I'm not unity party man. I'm not CVC man. I have remained totally out of party politics in Liberia, but I've been engaged on discussing national issues, and I did that for personal reasons. Because I don't see the political party structure in the bureau consistent with ideology and a sustained ideological posture. I think it's more about people finding their space and getting relevance and then finding entrance into government. I think that's most of the objective that I see. So that's the future position we can take the like next year, two years from now, we'll join their party. But I've not, I've, not, I've not made up my mind on the political party. And it's so good as a media person, and my history of being political is very, very important. So I think okay, I, we I welcome all his criticism. I welcome his criticism. I welcome his recommendation, and we'll take up from there. Okay, we got just one last caller, and uh, that's that's it. We are one minute over the time. Uh, we want to apologize for that. Uh, just before I take the last caller, though, I got two silly questions. Uh, one has to do with uh, I told you sometime during this program that. We were able to host Brother Lee Sila, the National Coordinator <laughs> for Parole and Probation Services in Liberia. We were able to host him here as a guest on this same show, even while he was in Liberia. Uh, mm -hmm. He just had to compromise a few hours of sleep. Is there any way you can help us to, you know, get us some guests from Liberia when he go back, so that we can get some fresh, you know, information from, uh, out of Liberia? Can you, you know, help help us in that regard? That's one concern. The other, the other concern is that uh, the text messages that came earlier with respect to a uh, few listeners not being uh, in, uh, not liking what you say, disagree profoundly, that they like to debate this issue instead. Uh, is there anything you'd be interested in, or you know that's a no for now? You are on a vacation, not a debate tour. So do you? No, we can do that. We can, if we can be done through, we can do it through the phone. I don't have a problem. I, oh, I, I like well, constructive well, engagement. In fact, I enjoy talking, and this is what I okay. do for life. So I won't, okay. I won't shy away from that, but I want it to be done on the platform of maturity. I want us to understand that we are not quarreling. We have to bring our logic through 
with the understand that somebody must believe or should believe what you're saying. Would you a professional? I don't have a no problem. I can sacrifice okay. some time in Monrovia. Then we can talk. Yeah, Rinchia, let me know. Okay. And trust me, uh, absolutely. I, absolutely. I, I like so, it. I enjoy that and I welcome that. Okay, uh, right now we say have a total of uh, a total of 57 people online. That's very good. Uh, some people have left. It's Monday. I miss. Monday going into Tuesday, people have to go to work early, so we still have 57 people. That's a very good number. So I will take I will take the last caller here, and if you want to, you know, uh, answer yeah, no that problem. question to, together with your closing remarks. So in in the interest okay. of time, that would be great. So Mr. Manu Belite, where are you calling from? And your question again, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Manu Belite from Wisconsin. Yeah. Uh, I want to go back to the issue of institutional barrier. Uh, yeah, uh, but in dislodging the argument of institutional bias against our people, he said that there is no written or recognized policy to justify that argument. Okay, uh, let's refer to the funding document of the United States of America, where it says we hold this truth to be self evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That's why the funding document of the United States saying that. Yes, there was institutional bias against the people, or against the black people of America. So, does it have to be written? Does it have to be written? Or it is a tendency? Because what I know about institutional bias, it doesn't have to be written. It can be a tendency also. So, I want you to please address yourself to that. <laughs> that is new to me. I don't know if there are institutional bias to anybody in America. That is new to me. Anyway, you know better than I do when it comes to America. But I don't know for sure in the Bureau that there are isolated cases where individual and you know, where persons, you know, acting in their own you know, out of their own hate or misconception of Madingo will do some wrong. I can tell you that that is possible, but to call it institutional bias and institution in court underlying capitalized, uh anyway, uh, we see it from different angles. You know, so I think uh, with that I don't want us to make that a debate. I think all we got to do, we got to, you know, work more on making ourselves relevant in a deal. Uh, we got to strengthen our internal unity. Uh, we got to stop the crap mentality. We got to be strategic in our push. And we got to call on the diaspora and the Burma Dingoes to do everything within their power to support those of us that are back home and uh, through funding, uh, through uh, 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 pieces of advice. You know, to open the dialogue for us to discuss the Madingo issues like we're doing tonight, and we're doing it openly, frankly, I top my mind, and <laughs> that's me. Uh, we need many persons to come on this network. As of now, I will be tuning in whenever I have the time, and we'll be contributing. I will also talk about this on my show, and I let people to know about it. Uh, these are platforms that we need. <laughs> we don't need any platform now to start insulting one another, doing all the negative things, we'll start portraying ourselves. Like I always say in the show, all true, that I am positive. And to okay. hold a positive view is very good. Okay. Well, I'll take that as your closing remark. Well, ladies and gentlemen, once again, we want to thank you so much for staying with us uh, this late hours of the morning. Oh, it's still, still 11 o'clock. It's not that super late in Minnesota yet, but I guess it's after 12 to where our guest is. Uh, so we want to thank each and every one of you on behalf of uh, the Liberian Diaspora Forum uh, show. Uh, me and my staff, we want to thank you for being part of the show tonight. We want to uh, particularly thank our guests for taking time off his busy schedule to come and uh, chat with us. Uh, we That was greatly appreciated. And we will uh, always call you when we have the need, and we hope you'll be willing to do this again sometime in the future. Uh, okay. We'll call you. So that will go from there. So from our end, uh, this show has been formally adjourned, and uh, we will close with a liberal national anthem as we begin. So thanks to everyone, and you have a good night.
ਹੋਰ ਬਾਕੀ ਬੋਲ ਜੋ